Good morning, distinguished colleagues. We're going to go ahead and get started because we have a very full morning. Can everyone hear me okay? We will give everyone just a minute to sit down. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning. Welcome to day two. Do I, should I ring the bell? I was hoping to avoid ringing the bell, but um, with the bell, let me uh, welcome you all to day two of the Alliance Against Trafficking mm -hmm. Conference. Uh, we're thrilled to have you back again uh, for day two, and we will now kick off panel number two on bridging gaps for more impactful prevention. And I will now turn the floor over to my friend and colleague to moderate, Ilias Chasitz, the head of the Human Trafficking and Migrant Smuggling Section of the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. Ilias, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carrie, and congratulations on uh, on this amazing event. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's um, it's a very important day on on the on the global anti-trafficking calendar, the uh, the alliance and the very interesting discussions last year prove it correctly so. Uh, so as uh, Carrie said, I'm Elias Hadzis. I'm uh, the United Nations Human Trafficking Migrant Smuggling League, and I will be moderating today's first panel that will be discussing how to bridge gaps for more impactful prevention. Together with our distinguished panelists, I hope to shed some light to shed, to shed some light on our understanding of human trafficking and on how to build more targeted and impactful prevention strategies. We often say that human trafficking is a hidden crime. Who are the traffickers? Where do the victims come from? How can we best protect and empower them? What are the links with other crimes? Where does the money go? These are, these are some of the questions I hear all the time. Questions where, despite our collective best efforts, we have few answers. What we know for a fact is that traffickers are fast to adapt and that they are exploiting their victims in increasingly sophisticated ways. We also know that the industry continues to evolve and thrive. To address this gap and beat traffickers at their own game, we need better data and reliable information. We need evidence. We can no longer, we can no longer afford to rely on guesswork and estimates. The presentation of this panel today will prove that we don't need to. Our speakers will share with us their own stories, helping us understand how to prevent trafficking and how to build evidence-based responses. My own office, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, contributes to these efforts with the various reports and analysis that we produce. Most prominently is our, annual, is, is our biannual report on the global state of anti-trafficking efforts. The next report will be available later this year and will be based on information received from over 140 countries and an analysis on, of over 1,000 court cases from around the world. Now, we all agree that we need more and better data. And I'm hopeful that developments like artificial intelligence with its endless capacities will also be a valuable ally in our efforts. But this thirst for information should not become a self-fulfilling goal. In some cases, we may already have the information we need. And here we need to ask ourselves, are we using the data we have efficiently? And are they informing our actions? For example, you know this is data, global data, have consistently shown for more than 15 years that one out of every three victims of human trafficking is a child. Did this finding lead us to concentrate significant efforts to towards uh, child trafficking? Unfortunately not. The high number of child victims is a shocking and embarrassing figure that should make us take immediate action against child trafficking. Today's panel will thus critically examine the divergence between data and actions as well. I hope that the issues and solutions we will be discussing can shape not only the conversation at this conference today, but also beyond. And before turning and introducing our panelists, I would like to remind you that you can register 
uh, for questions or statements after the, uh, the introductions made by the panelists. And then I would like to introduce our panel, starting with Dr. Suamir Pirano Guzman, who is a behavioral neurologist at UCLA Health, a survivor advocate and chairperson of the Board of Trustees and member of the United Nations Voluntary Fund for Victims of Contemporary Forms of Slavery and Trafficking. Valentin Berezeu is State Counselor and National Coordinator for Trafficking Human Beings in Romania. Kari Timmerman is a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And Anu Leps sir, is the advisor in the, in the Criminal Policy Department of the Ministry of Justice, of the Ministry of Justice in Estonia. And starting immediately, I would like to give the floor to Swamis for his you know, remarks. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's really a pleasure and honor to be back with you here. I had the opportunity to be here in 2022 and I continue to be uh, excited about the momentum of the Alliance Conference and the work that you all do. I would like to start with uh, perhaps a quote. Couple, couple of years ago, I, I felt burnt out. I felt that I didn't have, I feel like I've been working in the anti-trafficking sector for way too long and I hadn't had the results that I wanted. So I came across a quote from Martin Luther King that filled me up with energy. And I wish this quote does the same to you and it reminds you why you are here. It says, make a career of humanity, commit yourself to the novel struggle for equal rights. You will make a better person of yourself, a greater nation of your country, and a finer world to live in. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a finer world to live in without human trafficking, without exploitation, with everybody, men, boys, LGBTQ folks, and anybody who has been exploited have the right in, uh, to protection, safety in any country. Doesn't matter whether if it is in Europe, Africa, Asia, America. They deserve protection and they deserve your advocacy. Now, I want to thank the opportunity to speak to you today to, uh, uh, to the special representative, uh, Kerry Johnston, and the uh, U.S. M the U.S. JTIP office, Trafficking in Persons office, for the sponsorship for being uh, for me to attend this conference. Now, we are here to speak about a, a topic that affects millions and millions of people around the globe. And given the recent uh, report by ILO, we know that it just keep going up. The gains, the number of people who are being exploited are going up every single day. Now, this gathering of national authorities, civil society leaders, academics, and industry representatives highlight why we need a united front, but we don't just need it at the Alliance Conference. We need it every single day. We need your commitment every single day, not just at the Lions Conference. We need you every day on the ground doing the work with us so that we can best serve victims and, uh, and survivors of human trafficking. As we delve into our disc uh, discourse today, it is essential to remember that at the heart of what we are talking about, at the heart of everything that we do here, is about victims and potential victims who rights and dignity. We are here and we, are sh and we should be committed to, their, uh, to, ref to defend their rights. Now, the team of our panel prevention strategies require a data-driven approach that guides a collective action. This is both timely and necessary. In a world increasingly driven by data, it is imperative that our strategies to combat human trafficking are both informed by both quantity and qualitative insights. However, it's not just using data. It's not just doing research. It's also validating that research with the feedback and recommendations from survivors of human trafficking. I... Rafael and many, many other survivors of human trafficking are here and are able to support you and your efforts. Just seek us out. We're here to support you. Now, these insights are not only enhance our understanding, but also ensure that our response is targeted and effective. Well, we have spent over 20 years tackling human trafficking, and yet we're still using uh, uh, practices that are outdated and ineffective. The way that I experienced trafficking in 2004 is not the same way people are experiencing trafficking today. Therefore, our strategies, our efforts should evolve, just like traffickers are evolving to use Bitcoin, to use all their forms of uh, social media and all the technology available to them to exploit and, um, and abuse more people. Now, first, let us consider the role of data in understanding the scope and the nature of trafficking. Trafficking is a complex and multifaceted phenomenon, influenced both by economic, 
social and political factors. Comprehensive data collection should thus be multidisciplinary, incorporating insights from law enforcement, healthcare providers, social services providers, and non-governmental organizations. Now, these diverse data fact, uh, sources enhance our understanding of trafficking patterns and help us identify uh, vulnerabilities within populations at risk. We're, I'm, I'm so glad that tomorrow, uh, today actually, we have a side event on, on, on the nexus of disability and human trafficking. Um, also, I know that there's a publication at the OSCE coming up on the, uh, on the rights of minorities and how minorities are exposed to trafficking, especially in the OSCE region. Now, uh, um, these diverse data sources enhance our understanding of trafficking and, and they will help us make a better uh, and informed decision. However, the gap in between data collection and actionable insights remains a significant challenge. All too often, the data exists, but they exist in silos, unshared, underutilized, and due to bureaucracy, inertia, lack of resources, and concerns over privacy and protection. Now, to bridge this gap, we must promote a stronger collaborations across national uh, across sectors, national authorities, academia, and the private sector. Must work together now again, not only at the alliance conference, but every single day to collect data and inform our practices so that they're effective and targeted to the people who are experiencing trafficking every single day. Moreover, the, the digital age has brought us a new challenge, uh, brought us new challenges and opportunities to uh, in our fight against uh, human trafficking. Uh, cyber technologies and social media pl platforms are exploited to recruit uh, and recruit, exploit, and traffic people. Conversely, uh, these digital tools also offer unprecedented opportunities to gather real-time data, raise awareness, and mobilize responses that are targeted and. Um, to the people who are experiencing trafficking. Initiatives like digital reporting tools and online platforms for data sharing can enhance transparency and accountability, allowing for quicker response to trafficking threats as they arise. We must also address the financial underpinnings of trafficking networks. By targeting their financial flows, we can weaken the infrastructure that supports and perpetrates trafficking. Financial institutions in collaboration with law enforcement can leverage data analytics to identify suspicious transactions that may indicate trafficking activities. These factors are not only disrupt, will not only disrupt operational capacities, but also deter potential traffickers through the heightened risk of detention and prosecution. Proactive responses to emerging trends in trafficking require an adaptive and forward-thinking, forward-looking approach. We cannot be looking back at the 20 years that we have spent in effective practices. We have to look forward and engage in innovative ways of reaching victims and survivors of human trafficking. As traffic is evolves, so must our strategy to combat. This means continuously updating our, coll our data collection methods, analytical models to anticipate future trends rather than merely reacting to current ones. A scenario planning and predictive analytics can play pivotal roles in this regard, enabling us to locate, uh, to locate and predict um, resources more effectively and implement preventative uh, measures before new trafficking schemes fully take root. Finally, in it, the implementation of evidence-based strategies cannot be overstated. Data alone is not sufficient unless it's translated into action. Pilot projects that test new ideas and document their impact can, be, can provide the proof of concept needed to expand successful strategies. Furthermore, ongoing evaluations of prevention initiatives ensure that they remain relevant and effective as, as circumstances change. Now, in conclusion, my friends, our collective endeavor to prevent human trafficking in person is a testament that we can achieve when we combine expertise from, from or across uh, disciplines. Let this panel not just be a forum for discussion, but a catalyst for action that bridges the divide between data and impactful prevention. Together, we can forge a future where trafficking is not just mitigated, but it is er eradicated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suamez. Uh, and I, I note especially what you call the need for an adaptive and forward-looking approach that needs to you know, characterize our actions. So thank you very much uh, for your uh, remarks. And now we go to our second uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Valentin Vetejelu uh, from uh, you know, Romania. Valentin. Good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. 
Prevention is in general a sang-lax activity, undervaluated and sometimes lacking the necessary focus. This is why I would like to congratulate OAC for bringing back the attention on trafficking, on prevention, and especially on those areas of prevention that goes beyond raising awareness. Unfortunately, Romania continues to be a country of origin for victims of trafficking, with the prospect of becoming a country of destination from other, uh, from other countries, particularly the Asian ones. For Romania, the strategic concern of integrated anti-trafficking efforts started in 2006 when the first national anti-trafficking strategy came into force. At this very moment, we are about to launch the new strategy against trafficking in person 2024-2028 with the aim to reduce the impact and scale of trafficking in person at national level by prioritizing and streamlining the activities of public and private sector or responsibilities in this field. And in this regard, I want to thank OSC for their involvement and their support and the, uh, the powerful recommendations and the anti-trafficking team, especially Tarana and Radu, thank you for your commitment and we look forward to working with you in the following period. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, since 2023, Romania uh, has an interministerial anti-trafficking interministerial committee under the Prime Minister Office, established with the aim of ensuring a uh, coherent and coordinating approach for the implementation of public policies in the field of preventing and combating trafficking and assisting the victims. The interministerial committee will have a key role in the implementation of the new strategy in reviewing how the tasks are undertaken by each entity and determining the actions required to achieve the following uh, objectives of the strategy. Reducing the influence of the risk factor and vulnerabilities leading to victimizations to trafficking in persons. The criminal justice system is effective and efficient in trafficking cases, improving protection and assistance provided to victims of trafficking in persons, standardization of data collection process in the field of trafficking in persons, enhancing cooperation in horizontal areas of anti-trafficking system. Speaking of prevention that goes beyond raising awareness, we must focus on decreasing the impact of risk factors leading to victimization. Situational preparedness and social improvement are the objectives of prevention of trafficking in person, ensuring real effectiveness in the various stages of intervention. If situational prevention aims to protect people by informing them and establish uh, effective measures and behaviors, social prevention is much more effective in the long term. To effectively, effectively prevent human trafficking, it is crucial to address the underlying factors that make individuals susceptible to exploitation. This include poverty, inequality, lack of education, unemployment, conflict, and discrimination. Prevention efforts should focus on providing economic opportunities, promoting education, skills training, and addressing social and cultural norms that perpetuate vulnerability. Romania's new strategy against trafficking must be complemented by various national strategic documents, the government's program, Romania's national strategy of sustainable development, national strategy against organized crime, national strategy for public order and safety, national strategy for preventing and combat combating sexual violence, and the national strategy for promoting and protecting the rights of the child. Empowering vulnerable population, including women, children, migrants, refugees, and marginalized communities and minorities is fundamental to preventing trafficking. This involves providing education, healthcare, legal assistance, and social support services. As if it was not difficult enough, the last two years have complicated the situation of trafficking in persons even more. The waves of refugees from Ukraine fully tested Romania's reaction capacity in the face of major challenge. From February 2022 till the end of February 2024, 7.4 million of Ukrainian citizens entered Romania, of which almost 150,000 Ukrainians received temporary protection. Currently, around 80,000 Ukrainians still benefit of temporary protection, of which 75% have women and children a category with much higher risk of trafficking. Preventive measures have included ensuring them financial help and the needed support to adapt to the Romanian society. Moreover, Ukrainians receive free access to public health system education and the right to work. Romania created a mechanism intended to prevent situation of vulnerability of Ukrainian citizens, which could expose them to the risk of becoming victims of trafficking. At the same time, Romanian government is about to adopt a decision by which the beneficiaries of temporary protection will be granted the right to legal residence in Romania, which allows them to have 
uh, to access social benefits from the social protection system in Romania. Technology can be a powerful tool in preventing human trafficking by facilitating early detection, monitoring, and reporting of trafficking activities. We can leverage digital platforms, data analytics, and mobile applications to gather information, identifying patterns, tracking trends, and provide timely assistance to victims of trafficking. Additionally, investing in research and data collection efforts can enhance our understanding of trafficking dynamics and inform evidence-based prevention strategies. To effectively combat trafficking, it's imperative to have robust data. Trafficking operates in the shadows, making it difficult to quantify the true extent of the problem. Moreover, victims often fear coming forward due to stigma, fear of retribution, and lack of trust in the law enforcement. To enhance quantitative data collection, we should invest in improved reporting mechanisms, enhance data sharing in initiatives between agencies and across borders. Addressing the complexity of trafficking requires collaboration across disciplines, including law enforcement, social services, healthcare, academia, and civil society. By bringing together diverse perspectives and expertise, we can develop holistic prevention strategies that address the root causes of trafficking, provide comprehensive support to survivors, and prosecute perpetrators effectively. The digital environment brings both advantages and risks. The internet can be used both in good faith, but also to promote illegal activities. Exploiting the anonymity of the, and the reach of the online platforms, traffickers use digital tools to lure, exploit, and profit their victims. The Digital Service Act appeared at EU level and laid down a series of rules and regulations for online platform providers and to create a safer digital space for all users where fundamental rights are respected and protected. The EU Digital Service Act represents a significant step towards regulating online platforms and ensuring their accountability in preventing the misuse of technologies for criminal purposes. DSA creates the premises for intense collaboration between digital service coordinators and other relevant authorities involved in the fight against illegal activities happening in the online space. In the light of the European Union Digital Service Act, Romania's efforts exemplify a commitment to combating human trafficking in the digital age while upholding the principles of online freedom and accountability. In Romania, the Digital Service Coordinator is ANCOM, the National Authority for Management and Regulation in Communications. ANCOM will ensure a better protection of the digital space and uh, its users will examine how the intermediate service providers will comply with specific regulation laid down in the DSA. Romanian alignment with the DSA underscores its commitment to European cooperation in tackling cross-border challenges, including trafficking in persons. Speaking of Romanian efforts to prevent the misuse of technology, we focus on uh, uh, promoting IT companies to reject online, uh, online sexual and labor exploitation, the obligations of hosting services providers to report all suspicion of human trafficking, child trafficking, child pornography offenses to law enforcement strengthening the partnership between IT companies and state agencies. Uh, additional national legal framework need to uh, uh, ensure resources and keep the high level of, uh, of uh, training. Cybercrime units will improve their investigated methods and important resources will be allocated to target financial flows. Online campaign will address child exploitation and pornography, online recruitment, forced prostitution, and innovation in diversifying preventive measures against online traffickers by promoting good practice exchange with EU partners and international partners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valentin. And uh, thank you very much, Valentin, for presenting us Romania's uh, experience and the strategy. And one thing that I would Maybe like to know, and we can discuss maybe at the uh, the uh, at the second stage of this uh, of this panel, is how much this strategy needs to be adapted as Romania is becoming also, as you said, the country of destination, not only a country of origin. So I would be very interested to to hear your views on that. Thank you very much. And now we're turning to uh, Kathy. Kathy, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, 
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, member states, thank you so much for allowing me to be here to talk a little bit about my work and about the um, way I see forward for work on human trafficking. I'd want to thank um, Dr. Johnstone especially for and the OSCE team for the theme of this year, the important theme of prevention and beyond awareness raising. As a public health professional, I can tell you that prevention is our stock and trade, and it's probably the uh, most effective way we've ever seen um, to reduce the prevalence and to decrease harm. Uh, thank you. And, to, and for harm reduction, prevention is really the only way to go in any kind of large numbers. So today, I'm going to talk about the search for lost coins, swimming pool floaties, and miracles. I'll discuss some of the reasons why we've not yet found many trafficking prevention models that seem worth replicating or bringing to scale, and how I think we might make some progress. So I've given a lot of thought over the past um, 20 years to why we have, why we've why over the past 20 years we've spent billions of dollars and why we don't yet really have a proven intervention to prevent human trafficking. And this old cartoon really strikes me as a good analogy for our problem. So the well-dressed fellow says to the police officer, I'm looking for my quarter. And the police officer says, did you drop it here? The guy says, no, I, I dropped it two blocks down the street. So the police officer asks, well, then why are you looking for it here? And the guy says, well, because the light's better here. And to me, this sadly represents in some ways our, our similarly misguided approaches in our search for solutions to prevent trafficking. We've made incredible progress in um, making the world know that trafficking is a crime. However, we, for our intervention proposals, mostly what we've been doing is proposing what we can do rather than what needs to be done and investigating solutions where the problem is before it, it begins. Okay, so. Hold on to your hats for a little a little bit of evidence. Um, the spider web you see in the corner is called a Bayesian network analysis. <clears throat> Don't worry, it's really just a complicated way of saying that we went and when we were doing our study in Nepal, uh, there was an intervention to prevent Nepalese women from being trafficked to the Gulf states as migrant domestic workers. And what the spider web shows you is that we found that really the only um, real risk factors, and we looked at lots, we looked at education, we looked at literacy, we looked at debt, we looked at caste, we looked at autonomy and decision-making. And what, what we found was that the main risk factors, and I guess if you think about it, this won't be surprising, the main risk factors for being trafficked were the destination you were going to, the labor sector you were going to be in, and the recruiter who determined both of the former. And then as much as me as a human rights person and human rights people don't like to hear this, but the migration bans for the women who were under 30 to the destination countries well known for exploitation also seem to work. And then one other sad fact is what was protective having been exploited a previous trip. So then the next thing I'm going to tell you is that the intervention that was uh, the evaluation that was always also looking at another awareness raising intervention was a randomized control trial that was longitudinal also done in Nepal, where they did every kind of awareness raising imaginable on paper, on TV, on radio. And my colleague, Dr. Cecilia Mo, who led this study, found that public awareness raised victim blaming a little bit because people thought, well, I'm not going to get trafficked. They must not, 
they must have been really doing this badly. I'm going to do it better than that. And the police training, it was good for teaching about um, law enforcement against trafficking. But yeah, the police didn't kind of pick up on victims' rights. Okay. So in our study, when we did, um, when we evaluated work on awareness raising, what, what the awareness raising was focused on was telling women about their rights as workers and their rights as women. And then they were sent off to the Gulf states. So the thing is that when the women heard the, the training, they said that they found these really nice words, but they didn't really think it applied to them because even they understood that they couldn't assert these rights with the labor brokers. They couldn't assert the rights with their employers and certainly not against the state. They were a little bit like the little pool ducky in a hurricane. The powers were too big against whatever rights they might think that they had. So what should we do? Well, there's lots of things I think that we can do for prevention beyond awareness raising. And awareness raising, don't get me wrong, it's brought all of this into light. I mean, this is why I heard yesterday all of you saying how well um, the countries are doing in making everybody know that trafficking is a crime. But what can we do for prevention? Well, the first important thing is go where the problem is. Prevention, while it seems nice to empower people, they don't really have power against a hurricane. So for what we need to do is there's work going on around um, sending country intermediaries, labor recruitment agencies, but they don't have any power in the states where people land. So we need to go with the job placement agencies. I don't know how many projects are ongoing right now in the Gulf states with placement agencies, and I'm not picking on the Gulf states, it's just happened to be the study where <laughs> did my work. So we need to not only try to formalize recruitment agencies in the origin states, but we need to work with the job placement agencies in the destination who will have greater ability to eliminate upfront payments, for example, place people in safer jobs, and take responsibility for them when they have problems. We also need to support more strategic litigation and compensation. I was I was really sad to see that the number of global federal prosecutions in 2022 were down um, to 162 glo global, global, um, from 228 in 2021. There has been important civil cases, yet sadly, I will tell you that the victims are not the ones benefiting from a large and sufficient amount of compensation from these cases. So we need to make sure that since the only reason to bring the case is the harm to the victims, we need to get back wages. We need to get current disability payment, especially for injuries and mental distress that can affect future earning. When we did our study um, in the Mekong, one of the most predictive factors to somebody's poor mental health was whether they got cheated. I sort of summarize that as, geez, I went through all this for nothing? Okay, so survivor outreach. I think you guys talked yesterday about how, how that is really happening in a lot of the member states. But what I'd like to do as being a public health person and also with the Gender Violence and Health Center at my school is we know that sometimes victims of same as domestic violence, victims of trafficking, one of the only places they may go or people they may be in touch with is the health sector. And we can do much better using the health sector to get to the places that maybe police and, and labor inspectors can't go. And we can also use the health sector as a place where somebody comes into the A&E, the emergency room, to refer them to proper services that can help them get out of these situations. Labor inspections. 
a lot of them happen for health and safety, we need to make sure they're looking at employment terms. I would suggest that somebody um, take a look at Brazil prosecu Brazil's prosecutor's office, who's using really um, great new techniques like satellite imagery to identify the places where some of these crimes are happening. And they're also now using a new inspection algorithm to detect forced labor. Um, employers, supply chains, and the Bitcoin stuff, definitely, <laughs> I'm going to leave that to Valentin's lunchtime because I can barely turn on my computer. But what's missing? What's missing? What's missing in the middle? Yeah, the workers. I love that we have survivor leaders. I love their voices in this. Thank you. But we're not yet quite going to the workers to get them involved. That's prevention. It's great to involve the survivor leaders to tell us what to do, how to do it. But if we don't involve the workers who are in these centers to tell us how they're being exploited, then we're not going to get very far. OK, number two. Human trafficking has been a great umbrella term to bring to attention the numerous forms of exploitation that happen around the world. But the solutions, they won't be the same for fishing as they are for forced begging, as they are for domestic work. We need to have sector-specific strategies. OK, of course, my favorite, treat as a public health challenge. I was, I, I can't believe it, but I was here in 2006. <laughs> and in 2006, um, what we heard a lot about was prosecution. And this, this meeting today warms my heart. Prosecution, we need it. We need to declare this as a crime. But I'd like to look at harm reduction. So, what we need to do is we need to think about the different ways that we can reduce harm. For me, binary indicators that we have for trafficking are super useful. But for prevention, we can do all sorts of harm reduction. And what might this look like? Oh, well, that didn't show up very well. OK. <laughs> so harm reduction means getting involved in things like occupational health and safety. And it means getting involved in freedom of, move, freedom of movement. And we can then also reduce long hours that cause exhaustion. We can also address the questions of social freedom and people being able to contact their families and contact friends and have a social life. So for in so example, in some cases, the long hours may be the thing that people most object to in exploitative work. And I would say that while I'm certainly in favor of eliminating trafficking, I think there's millions of low wage and exploited workers who we can help at the same time as we're looking for trafficking cases. OK, so number four. I work in research. I am 100% in favor of evaluation. But what I'm not in favor of is wasting money on premature evaluation. I've heard so many calls for randomized control trials on good ideas. I don't think we want to do that. Just for an example, a community-based randomized control trial will cost you for sure over a million dollars, sometimes when the intervention only costs a small amount. Now. That's worth it when you have enough research to prove that the intervention is worth evaluating. So number five, we need R&D. I put up these images to show you all the different places where we wouldn't even think of good guesses. We wouldn't think of a good guess in a pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing discovery, right? They spend 10 years, they spend a decade developing drugs and they're still developing cancer drugs after what 30 years is it we don't do enough r d in our field of trafficking we make good guesses and we need to be intervention focused i'm happy to answer more questions about that later what that might look like but i just want to take a quick second 
to praise um, the U.S. State Department JTIP's recent call. They took a step back and they said, let's not ask people to put good guesses in their proposals. Mm -hmm. Let's t ask them what is the problem they're trying to solve and how are they going to do the R&D to solve it? Right now, we have four projects going on. I'm happy to be a part of the, um, the evaluation and guidance team. We have one that's in Ethiopia on disabled children who were sent for begging. We have one on kidney failure among trafficked migrant workers from Nepal, and another one going on in the LGBTQIA sex worker community in Thailand. Now, don't worry, I'm coming to the end. So, Number six, evaluate the black box. The problem with good guesses and the problem with awareness raising has been that we think we have thought that if we empower people, which is totally a, a wonderful thing to do. I work on violence against women. We have to empower people and we have to teach them their rights. But is that gonna prevent trafficking? I think there was a black box that nobody thought about. And what they thought of was, and here it is, your miracle. We thought somehow empowering people would miraculously prevent them from being trafficked, and it didn't. So we need the R&D process to say what's going to be in that black box. Finally, as a community dedicated to finding effective and sustainable solutions, what should we do going forward? I would suggest that those who are in positions to invest in solutions need to avoid investing in large scale good guesses and instead make more strategic investments in research and development of prevention, prevention activities to gather evidence that involves co-production with the people who are most affected and who are the targets of our intervention efforts. And let me repeat, that's workers in all the sectors. And I know we're all here to exchange ideas and information, which is great. And I'm so honored to be given time to offer these thoughts. But what I would like to see is funding for different groups who are grantees of various intervention types and focus to be brought together, sorry, various intervention types and focus and bring us together, bring all of us together, not just for a speaking forum, but for a workshop where we really can exchange ideas about what's been working in my country, what's been working in your country, what's been working in my sector, what's been working in your sector, so we can learn across projects and how then we can use our joint learning to decide what should be funded and importantly, what should not be funded. I think if we had done this earlier, encouraged real dialogue about what failed or what didn't work so well, we might have used some of that awareness raising funding for other things. So with these last few comments, um, I leave it to the budget holders and the decision makers to consider the best ways we move forward with a better, better plan for research and development and international cross-disciplinary sharing and learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for the very animated uh, presentation. Yeah, and the, uh, also the, uh, I think the, it gave us a lot of, uh, a lot of, Food for for uh, for thought, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions, especially on the need to to go beyond awareness raising, and that has been dominating the thinking about prevention for many years, not really effective actions. Thank you very much. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions afterwards on that. Uh, and then I will move to our last uh, speaker. Anna, you have the floor. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates of the countries, international organizations, and NGOs. Um, my special gratitude to be here to, to present uh, Estonian experience goes for the OSC team, uh, with whom we have had long-lasting cooperation and just recently numerous of uh, common activities. 
to uh, share what we have done in Estonia, uh, I would start uh, with uh, the graph, which shows that how many crimes of trafficking we have at the moment. These are the data from 2023. As you can see from the graph uh, uh, up, uh, this uh, goes for the numbers of trafficking crimes. And uh, below the description goes for the trafficking related crimes. If we consider the statistics, then we always look to the bigger picture. We also look for the crimes, for the crimes of pimping, for the crimes of influencing youngsters uh, to be engaged into prostitution, for example, to see that what could be the other crimes which could lead to trafficking. Because we see by the numbers that uh, trafficking crimes itself, it's a small number, but this is a tip of the iceberg. And what we have seen just from the last year, that um, awareness raising and the prevention, which we have done uh, in the labor sectors uh, by the labor inspector from one side, but also uh, through the employers, has showed that we actually now have the cases of trafficking from uh, the labor market. So this has changed. Uh, never ever have been so that we have had more of the registered crimes of tra trafficking per um, labor exploitation than the, uh, sexual exploitation over the years. This has happened last year. So we can see that this lead uh, of uh, dedicating attention to the prevention has uh, gone also to, to these uh, statistical numbers, which show that we actually have these uh, heavy cases somewhere which hasn't been detected yet. As uh, Valentin also said, the year of 2006 is somehow relevant to everybody. We also started our work uh, more dedicated to uh, uh, prevention of trafficking in 2006, when it was agreed by the government that national coordination comes from the Minister of Justice. We have the National Roundtable, and since this year, we also have had the dedicated developmental plans for preventing trafficking. Since the year of 2010, we have um, kind of integrated the forces together. We see that trafficking crime, as any of the other violent crimes, that's, we have to look at them uh, basically together. And so they are engaged. Uh, we have had uh, for a number of years a lot of the trafficking crimes for, for, uh, for the purposes of sexual exploitation, which actually are quite similar to the heavy domestic violence cases. So nowadays we have the strategy which uh, is dedicated to prevent uh, violent crimes and uh, for these years, we also consider that uh, this last strategy lasts for 2025. You can see the graph on the, on the right side. It has also a number of the other goals to reach uh, to prevent violent crimes. And, uh, and for the first time, we also consider to evaluate the effect of the strategy after 2025. Uh, so far, of course, we have been reporting the activities done and all the um, interactions which are done uh, with the collaborative uh, activities uh, with different sectors, but we haven't actually uh, evaluated that whether do we have any of the effect of these activities we have done over the more than 10 years, actually. The prevention of trafficking in Estonia has been kind of... Uh, I did put it on, on this graph as, uh, as these bubbles. Uh, we have done a lot of the activities which have been one-time activities, a lot of the lectures, a lot of the uh, media activities, which we also haven't evaluated. But nowadays we think that this is also needed. But we have to go to these communities. We have to go to this workforce, as Cathy said, that you have to raise the awareness, not just uh, in the public sphere, but you have to go to the communities and to the close cooperation partners who can actually see, who can react, and who can actually prevent whether it's a uh, uh, trafficking happening uh, initially or then uh, preventing the longer term harm and to work with the harm reduction. We have used all these traditional channels and formats in Estonia, but we see that we have to go more into depth with 
offering long-lasting solutions. So now, uh, in addition to the trainings of ABC of trafficking, we also offer e-learning courses, and we work this, uh, we work out this at the moment uh, for the sectors who actually are able to react and to notice trafficking crimes, but also for the sectors who can train their own colleagues. At the moment, we have the ongoing cooperation with the um, Association of Estonian Restaurants and Hotels to uh, uh, raise the awareness of the personnel who works uh, in the hotels, administrators from the front desk, that they would actually notice the trafficking crimes happening. Or if they see any signs, then what are their activities, what they do to, uh, to empower them to react. Mainly, we are able to say uh, that trafficking has been, uh, or prevention of trafficking has been uh, at the moment um, more financed uh, from the project funding, but we consider this to be more financed from the state budget and, and from, from this money, which you are able to say that this also produces sustainability. And which, what has happened uh, throughout these years from 2006 up to, up to now, uh, we can see that the understanding in the sectors who actually should react, I mean like police, prosecutors' offices, uh, social services, uh, local governments, uh, that they can actually understand that trafficking is the crime happening in Estonia. Not that just uh, we are the transit country for that, or we could be the origin country. Nowadays, we are able to consider ourselves, if we uh, take the labor market, that we are also the destination country. We have a lot of the workers from the third country nationals who come to work in Estonia and who, we have, uh, who have been put in the heavy circumstances without unpaid salaries, long working hours, and also uh, shady um, agreements with their employers about how, where they live, how they actually have reached Estonia. So these are the cases which should be looked more into depth. And we have to prevent the bigger harm done and uh, to, uh, to gain back this, these people's uh, self-confidence and also to, to help them to support the families, which was the initial perspective of them, and, uh, and to have this better life, what they expected to have, not to harm them. So one of the success stories I can bring out from the public awareness is uh, one of the campaigns we held uh, now already seven years ago. Uh, Elu in Estonian or One Life in English uh, is uh, this, you can uh, look it up in the YouTube later on. But we used different channels and the focuses was uh, to uh, uh, give more understanding to the subjects of sexual exploitation and uh, labor exploitation. And most, uh, um, we choose the different target groups, but the, the best success story for, out of that was to address the target group uh, of youngsters. And we saw that we made a number of the true story-based videos for them uh, to share the experience, what the young person might, see, might have uh, on the labor market uh, with, uh, in relation with the post criminality and also in the, in the romantic uh, relationships, which might end up of being sexual exploitation, that how they can actually see that this might be their own thing. And we also made the survey later on um, asking uh, the public opinion that how they actually noticed uh, these awareness activities which we did. And uh, we have had the possibility to have this public opinion uh, survey to do three times. We did it in 2014, 16, and now just recently, uh, this column on the right side, uh, these um, results will be uh, uh, published tomorrow, actually. So you are the first ones to see. Um, we have seen that the scale of people seeing 
uh, information from the media, uh, this is in rise. People see actually that uh, trafficking information has been offered to them through the different media channels. Uh, we a bit changed the questioner, so it's not the data exactly the same and, and comparable. Uh, but in total, you could see that 30% of the growth has come uh, for that, that people saw information about trafficking in media. But where we are actually happy and where we can see the dedication through the national strategies and the work we have done with, uh, in cooperation with our colleagues is that people have seen and noticed and know the subject from the workplaces and they know it from the studies. So this is also one of the perspectives we have had. Uh, the special course for uh, young lawyers studying in Tartu University for a couple of years. We also have reached the media students from Tallinn University to give them understanding of what the trafficking is and how they could actually see it in the, in the work later on. Which we didn't ask earlier, but uh, it is essential to understand also that what is the experience of Estonian people with the trafficking crimes, whether they have been victims themselves or whether they know somebody who has been. And the last 15% on the right column shows that, that from this uh, uh, public opinion survey, we see that we have these people who have experienced this crime or who at least know somebody who has. So now what we have to do is that we have to target those people as well to search uh, for the services and also to see that they could be the assistants and the advocates for those people who actually need to, to get to the services. But generally speaking, we have seen that all these activities we have done for preventing trafficking is uh, part of the package of the whole understanding how to prevent any of the crimes and how to prevent crimes in general. So we have started a couple of years ago in Estonia um, the um, uh, Prevention Science Council, which has the objective to uh, look at this evidence, what Cassie told you earlier. Uh, look at the um, interactions, all the prevention interventions we do, that whether they actually work. They evaluate the interventions done in Estonia. Of course, as said already before, uh, evidence-based practices are needed and analytical touch has to be added and uh, a lot of service has to be done, but they not always have to be randomized control studies. You can evaluate your activities uh, differently as well, but you have to do it. So this Science Council uh, has, for now, uh, look through uh, different prevention initiatives, starting from the positive parenting, uh, going up for the, um, for the practices which are used for the uh, persons who use drugs. So they will also look in the future for the interventions done for preventing trafficking. And this information goes for the governmental body, National Prevention Council, which gives advice for the government. So, this is a brief overview of the action plan, but what do we expect to have with this reform of uh, prevention is to, to reduce the harms done. Because you also are able to, to uh, make harm with prevention activities if you don't choose the right target group, if you don't choose the interaction which is needed for them, and if you don't consider risk and protective factors they actually have in their own environments. So the intention is to improve the quality of prevent preventive interventions and to put more forces to the workforce, as it was also said in the previous speech, and also to work with the funding so that the funding for uh, evaluating prevention uh, comes to the picture and this comes essential for the policy makers. So this, think, uh, this thinking way is that uh, if, we are, if we compare it uh, with the sports, then we are not the sprinters. We go for the marathon. And that's a long way to go, but at least we have made the efforts to start to, uh, to have 
uh, better and effective prevention of trafficking crimes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anu, for presenting Estonia's uh, experience and also for outlining the um, the elements that uh, will be required for an impactful awareness awareness campaign. So thank you for that. We have heard in this panel from two national experiences. We have heard from the academia. We have heard from survivor leaders. And I think now is the time to uh, to open the floor to statements and questions. I have already a list for those that have asked to take the floor, and I will go through the. Uh, uh, the countries and the um, and the people and the participants who have asked for the floor. I would appreciate if you could stay, I mean, just be brief so we have the opportunity to at least go once again back to our panelists so they have a chance for concluding remarks and maybe to address some of the issues that have been referenced already. So I would like to start with the first uh, on the list, which is uh, Armenia. Delegate from Armenia, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. We extend our appreciation for the organization of the 24th Conference of the Alliance Against Trafficking in Persons. The development of a modern globalized world not only brings positive results in human progress, but also poses significant challenges for states and societies globally, regionally, and locally. The problem of human trafficking and exploitation is one of those issues that has an explicit transnational nature and should concern all nations. Regardless, the crime of human trafficking directly and indirectly threatens human life and health. The fundamental challenge for all states is to develop deep and comprehensive policies and mechanisms to address those issues, both by eliminating the consequences and undertaking preventive measures. The comprehensive interagency approach and national mechanism in the fight against human trafficking and, and exploitation in Armenia started back in 2002. In order to effectively counteract human trafficking, the government of Ar Armenia approved the concept of preventing the tra transportation, transfer and sale, trafficking of people from Armenia in the purpose of exploitation and abuse. Since then, seven national programs have been adapted and implemented in the country. The first national program was approved in 2004 and the seventh one in 2023. Based on the components set out in all the national programs, pro programs, we continuously and gradually do our best to make the fight against human trafficking and as exploitation more inclusive and comprehensive. The government of Armenia prioritizes implementation of most effective preventive measures, identification of potential victims, as well as improvement of the support and clarification of protection mechanisms. Within the framework of the adapted national policy, Armenia has undertaken the responsibility to act properly to prevent, investigate and punish the perpetrators of the trafficking, as well as to protect and assist the victims. Armenia cooperates with the UN, OSCE, and Council of Europe, in particular with the Group of Experts on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings, Greta, over combating human trafficking. After its last monitoring visit to Armenia in 2021, Greta published its report on Armenia, where, along with the acknowledgement of improvements in the legislative and policy framework, Greta focused on the human trafficking victims' access to justice and effective remedies. Greta also welcomed the existence of specialized entities for combating human trafficking within the police and the investigative committee of Armenia. In the context of human trafficking, we continue to remind about the inextricable nexus that we see between the trafficking of human beings and enforced disappearances, resulting from our conflicts and in relation to prisoners of war in particular, which against the backdrop of recent events in our region is of particular relevance and urgency. Finally, giving special significance to raising awareness in the fight against human trafficking, the government of Armenia implements large-scale awareness activities. In particular, two years ago, Armenia joined the Blue Heart campaign, initiating the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Awareness and Prevention Information campaign. In this process of raising awareness, we, we unite the efforts of all actors in the area, including social and international pa partners, with the objective of spreading information about the problem and all the mechanisms related to, this, to its solution through various information platforms. 
Mr. Moderator, let me conclude by stressing once again the importance of international cooperation to unite forces in combating human trafficking and ex ex exploitation. Armenia stands ready to continue joining the efforts and contributing to the OSC agenda to face and overcome this global threat. Thank you. I would like to thank the distinguished delegate of Armenia. And next on my list are uh, Belgium on behalf of the European Union, the United States, and then Germany. Belgium, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Moderateur. Avec votre permission, je passe la parole à la délégation de l'Union européenne. The EU would like to thank the panelists for their contributions and insights into tools and practices for more impactful prevention strategies. While acknowledging persisting gaps and challenges, we remain committed to addressing them. The current situation marked by Russia's ongoing war of aggression against Ukraine, the increased digitalization of our society, and the economic downturn following the COVID-19 pandem pandemic drastically shaped the context within, with, within which opportunities for traffickers to exploit persons in vulnerable situations can emerge. Failing to identify trends such as the exploitation for criminal activities or root causes of trafficking can create gaps and enable traffickers to take advantage of such situations. For this purpose, continuous research and cross-society approaches are crucial to take into account all realities. We commend the research work carried out by the Office of the Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings for releasing numerous reports and studies. We note with interest its ambition to release papers on trafficking covering the topics of trafficking in human beings and disabilities and trafficking in minorities. Additionally, supporting our action with necessary data is paramount to an effective approach. Systematic and detailed data collection enables actors to gather more reliable and comparable data to map trends and challenges in order to keep developing effective, targeted and adapted measures. The review, revision of the anti-trafficking directive, which was recently agreed upon, um, formalizes an annual EU-wide data collection on trafficking. We encourage other participating states to follow its footsteps with initiatives aiming at improving their data collection. Awareness raising, although its impact may be challenging to measure, remains a powerful tool in prevention. To increase effectiveness, it must target the general public, but also relevant groups such as policymakers, enforcement officers, the private sector, the medical sector, social services, as well as the youth, media and persons in vulnerable situations. The EU has launched a campaign seeking to inform potential victims and making victims of this crime visible. This has encouraged informed victims to report their condition and improve detection, including outside the target of the campaign. Finally, addressing technology-facilitated trafficking in human beings is essential in bridging gaps for more impactful prevention. The EU has sought to actively engage with the digital world, holding discussions with internet platforms, tech companies and social media to raise awareness on the prevention and detection of human trafficking. The Digital Services Act also introduces the due diligence obligations for providers of intermediary services, such as online platforms and social networks, to reduce illegal and harmful activities online, including trafficking in human beings. Thank you. I would like to thank Belgium and the European Union, and now I would like to turn to the United States and Ambassador Dyer. Thank you so much, and many thanks to the panelists for their candid and illuminating discussion. In the United States, one challenge we face is broadening knowledge of the resources that reduce vulnerability to trafficking. In too many cases, vulnerable people just do not know that crucial resources exist. To take Ukrainian refugees as an example, we have myriad services available to them that would reduce their vulnerability, including health insurance through Medicaid, which is a U.S. public health insurance program, and other services funded through the Office of Refugee Resettlement. But as of late spring 2022, only about one quarter of Ukrainian refugees surveyed in one major destination, Chicago, 
had actually made contact with a service provider who could explain how to access these services and complex systems. To bridge this knowledge gap and reach vulnerable populations where they are, the U.S. government is working towards implementing a public health approach to prevention and employing targeted prevention education strategies as discussed in the Department of Health and Human Services National Human Trafficking Prevention Framework, which was released in February. The public health approach to prevention recognizes that trafficking is a public health issue and a crime that impacts not just individuals, but families and communities. It also encourages culturally specific prevention efforts. For Ukrainian refugees in the United States, research shows this means working through specific, commonly used Facebook sites and through faith-based organizations. To achieve our desired outcome of increases in help-seeking behavior, the U.S. government is working to better target prevention education so that both U.S. citizens and foreign nationals are aware of their rights and of the economic supports available to them. And we commend these strategies for your attention and consideration as well. I would now like to pass the floor to my colleague, Mr. Bautista. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador Dyer. Um, it has been observed that involvement of survivors or subject matter experts in the creation, revision, and delivery of programs and trainings has been an effective approach in bringing about meaningful change. Also, compensating these experts currently is fundamental. To ensure that survivors receive assistance they deserve, it is important that we change from transactional services to more effective uh, services. And what I mean by transactional services is that survivors doesn't have to testify to receive housing or to do whatever you guys need us to do to get the help that we deserve. In contrast, transactional services place the onus on survivors, forcing them to, need to meet certain requirements before they can receive the help they deserve. This approach can be harmful and re-traumatizing for survivors. Moreover, it will lead to negative outcomes in the persecution and conviction of the traffickers. It is imperative that we move beyond transactional services and create more empathetic and compassionate solutions for survivors or those in need. Thank you. I would like to thank the United States for their remarks. And I would like now to move to Germany, but before that, to let you know that I have on my list after Germany, the Russian Federation, Azerbaijan, Canada, and the Kyrgyz Republic. So Germany, you have the floor. Thank you very much. First of all, let me congratulate Carrie Johnston and her team for her excellent work and for including such an important subject in today's agenda. It was stressed by many speakers today. There is no doubt. We all need reliable data to be successful in our joint fight against THB. And yet, we all know that getting this data is a huge challenge. In Germany, close cooperation with as many stakeholders as possible has been important in tackling this challenge. Let me give you a quick example. The German Federal Criminal Police Office publishes data on completed criminal investigation procedures in its yearly reports on THB. The report provides an insight on various criteria of both victims and perpetrators, regional distribution, and general trends in the field of THB. For four years now, the German NGO networks against THB, the KOK, have gathered and published its own data report based on the cases registered with their counseling centers on THB. The data in the KOK report is complementary to the data presented by the police. That means, first, it shows a different set of cases. In 2022, of the 733 cases analyzed in the KOK report, 35% entailed criminal investigations. That means 65% of those cases would not have been visible to us if we hadn't consulted data available to civil society. Second, it provides information on different aspects. 
such as the victim's reality and needs which, according to the report, often go far beyond the crime in question and include aspects as psychological support, the resident status, or child care. What I would like to highlight with this example is that depending on our profession, be it policymakers, police officers, NGOs, we see human trafficking from different perspectives, each of which has their value and is vital for us to get the whole picture. Aiming to bring those perspectives together, we have, have installed an independent national rapporteur mechanism at the German Institute for Human Rights. The head of this mechanism, Nigel Tarnish, is with us today. I'm happy about it. Its main task is to gather, analyze, and publish data on all levels of governance and civil society and to draw recommended action from this data. And let me conclude by sharing my strong belief. All these efforts to improve data will have a huge impact in reality. With this goal, our current drafting process of the National Action Plan against THB in Germany relies as much on data and different perspectives as available to us. Thank you. Thank you, Germany. And now I would like to give the floor to the Russian Federation. Спасибо большое, уважаемые участники конференции. Хотел бы в первую очередь поблагодарить выступавших сегодня спикеров за их очень интересный вклад и большое спасибо, что поделились вашим национальным опытом. Современные технологии активно используются торговцами людьми для привлечения потенциальных жертв, распространения противоправных материалов, размещения рекламы, нелегальных услуг, совершения сделок. Это требует незамедлительной реакции компетентных органов. Однако современные технологии также и помогают в борьбе с трафикингом, позволяют отследить действия и местонахождение преступников, обмениваться данными, находить информацию по конкретным маркерам. Интернет в целом важный инструмент для повышения осведомленности граждан об этой проблеме. Таким образом, на первый план выходит сегодня грамотное применение современных технологий для противодействия торговли людьми и в то же время эффективная борьба с их противоправным применением. В противодействии трафикингу одним из ключевых элементов является устранение первопричин возникновения и распространения данного явления в том числе бедности, безработицы, социальной незащищенности. Необходимы целевые социально-экономические меры на государственном уровне, поддержка малоимущих и многодетных семей, институты семьи в целом, продвижение образовательных программ и программ по профессиональной переквалификации, охрана детских учреждений, семейных детских домов и программы сопровождения сирот. Это важно, потому что в цифровой среде перед угрозой стать жертвами торговли детьми и связанных с ней преступлениями наиболее уязвимы дети. Система борьбы с преступлением против них должна основываться на принципе соблюдения наилучших интересов ребенка, как это закреплено в Конвенции о правах ребенка. В нашей стране создана сеть учреждений социального обслуживания семьи и детей, Находятся они в ведении органов исполнительной власти субъектов Российской Федерации. Действуют семейные центры помощи, которые занимаются профилактикой беспризорности, обеспечением защиты прав детей, оставшихся без родителей, адаптацией к самостоятельной жизни детей-сирот и другими смежными вопросами. В целом, тематика защиты детей всегда являлась, являлась для России одним из приоритетов. И руководствуясь этим, наша страна предпринимает меры, нацеленные на обеспечение Безопасность детей, безопасности детей в наилучших интересах. И именно эти меры, к сожалению, некоторыми делегациями извращаются в угоду политической повестки. Мы неоднократно повторяли, что Россия, как и положено правовому государству, эвакуирует детей из зоны боевых действий для обеспечения их безопасности. Ни о каком насильственном удержании, ассимиляции и установлении речи не идет. Но некоторые, выступавшие здесь с этими затертыми штампами, явно не хотят видеть правду, а продолжают безответственно манипулировать детской тематикой исключительно в целях пропаганды. Спасибо большое.
I would like to thank the Russian Federation. And now I would like uh, to move to Azerbaijan. But before that, just to let you know that we also have Canada and the Kyrgyz Republic afterwards. So Azerbaijan, you have the floor. Thank you. Prevention human trafficking in some points, and I would like uh, to speak a little about one of these points. What's the decision of the cabinet of ministries from 2011 uh, approved the program for el elimination of social problems, creating conditions for human trafficking, and the uh, goal of this program to prevent the human trafficking and the task of this program is enhance is to enhance the level of living of the uh, vulnerable group, asylum seekers, neglected children, presumed and potential victims of human trafficking. I emphasize that program entirely funds by the government of Azerbaijan. And this program uh, contains four directions of activity. And the first direction uh, is institutional measures and monitoring uh, for detection of illegal migrants, uh, legalization of their living in Azerbaijan, uh, detect monitoring for identification of uh, victims of human trafficking and protection them. Uh, the ensuring the safety of in information, increasing the adoption procedures, uh, facilitating the available remedies, uh, training the authorities, uh, in learning the international practice, etc. The second point: uh, measures for detection of vulnerable groups, asylum seekers, neglected children, uh, accommodation them. Uh, to ensure them the social, uh, psychological, juridical, financial, medicine, and other aids, and analyzing the uh, current problems, social problems, and suggestion for solution to these problems. Uh, the third direction is involving the jobless teens to the uh, paid work. Uh, uh, to organize organizing the uh, vocational free vocational trainings uh, to increasing the competitiveness of the uh, vulnerable groups in the labor market and uh, to stimulation the uh, establishment to the recruit of vulnerable groups and determination the duty quota with the vulnerable groups etc the third, uh, the fourth uh, point of activity is awareness raise, raising measures, as awareness raising measures against human trafficking in prison, in educational inter, uh, establishment, awareness raising measures uh, against early marriage, against uh, domestic violence. Uh, awareness raising measures uh, for using inter internet and other social sets safety uh, and publicity of the uh, information about la labor market, etc. Uh, and the executors of the, this program are 11 state bodies as Minister of Interior, Minister of Justice, Minister of Health, Minister of uh, communication and high technologies, Ministry of Science and Education, and others. And this uh, program uh, is uh, uh, being implemented successfully 
uh, I should notice that uh, more than 30,000 people have taken advantage from this program. Thank you for attention. Thank you for giving applause. I would like to thank the distinguished uh, delegate of Azerbaijan. And now I would like to give the floor to Canada, the Director General of Law Enforcement and Crime Prevention Branch. You have the floor. Merci, Monsieur. Permettez-moi tout d'abord de remercier l'OSCE d'avoir organisé cet événement très utile. I am pleased to be here and particularly interested in this conference's theme on bridging gaps for more impactful prevention and thank the speakers that have shared their insights so far on this topic, particularly on the need to address intersectionality as well as consider vulnerabilities exacerbated by factors such as social exclusion, climate, exchange, climate change, and forced displacement linked to conflicts. This is particularly relevant in the context of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine and the heightened risks of trafficking in persons it generates. I'll highlight Canada's national strategy to combat human trafficking and offer some insights on the critical sources of information that we rely on to inform our prevention efforts. The national strategy was launched in 2019 after comprehensive consultations with victims and survivors, service providers, community-based organizations, elders, and Indigenous leaders, which has guided us to where we are today. We are beginning to see the benefits of our efforts to fill gaps in the data that we rely on to inform policies and programs. To complement what we learn from police and courts, we benefit from the information provided by Canada's Human Trafficking Hotline. It offers insights into the experiences of victims and survivors who call the hotline, and in particular, about those key services and supports that they need the most. The trauma-informed model of the hotline places the needs of victims and survivors above all else. This means that some data collected is not shared in order to protect their privacy. However, the data that we do receive complements the existing crime data within Canada. For example, through reported cases, we know that in Canada, sexual exploitation is involved in the majority of trafficking cases reported to law enforcement, and that it primarily occurs in large urban centres and overwhelmingly affects Canadian women. However, through partnerships such as the hotline, media and academia, we are increasingly hearing more incidents of forced labour being reported, mostly involving male foreign nationals. Furthermore, international and Canadian data suggests that organized crime groups are engaging in not only trafficking in persons, but also in commodities such as drugs and firearms. This intelligence on polycriminality will also strengthen our response to human trafficking moving forward. All of these sources of information, along with continued collaboration with domestic and international partners around data collection, remains critical to inform our prevention efforts moving forward. To conclude, fully understanding the strengths and limitations that each of our sources of information bring will collectively move towards ensuring a truly victim-centered and trauma-informed approach that leaves no person behind and no victim unsupported. Merci. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Canada for their uh, intervention. And uh, our last uh, uh, country on our list is the Kyrgyz Republic. And after the Kyrgyz Republic, we'll go to, uh, to survivor leaders and then other organizations and civil society that have asked for the floor. So I would like now to give the floor to the Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, thank you. Уважаемые участники 24-й конференции Альянса по борьбе с торговой людьми, позвольте поделиться информацией о ситуации в Кыргызской Республике по проводимым мероприятиям в вопросах предотвращения преступлений, связанных с торговлей людьми. В Кыргызстане в 2022 году впервые учрежден Институт докладчика по торговле людьми при спикере парламента Кыргызстана. В декабре 2023 года Впервые был презентован для уполномоченных государственных органов и гражданского общества альтернативный отчет по ситуации противодействия торговли людьми в Кыргызстане. На сегодняшний день ведется работа по созданию аналитического центра для ведения мониторинга рассматриваемых кейсов органами государственной власти 
и гражданского общества, выяснение коренных причин торговли людьми и выработки рекомендаций для всех субъектов противодействия торговли людьми. Ведется работа по усилению законодательства Кыргызстана по вопросам противодействия торговли людьми. К примеру, в январе 2023 года были внесены изменения и дополнения в закон о предупреждении борьбе с торговлей людьми в части приведения в соответствии с Конвенцией ООН против транснациональной организованной преступности 2000 года и дополняющих ее протоколов. Ужесточена санкция согласно уголовного законодательства за торговлю людьми, а также выведена отдельная статья за торговлю детьми, санкция которой предусматривает максимальное лишение свободы. Ведется работа по улучшению национального механизма перенаправления жертв торговлю людьми в вопросах идентификации жертв, дальнейшей их ресоциализации и реинтеграции в общество. Активно реализуется и проводится работа согласно национального плана действий в рамках реализуемой четвертой государственной программы Кабинета министров противодействия торговли людьми. Учитывая ситуацию в мире и тенденцию распространения онлайн-рекрутинга и онлайн-мошенничеств, созданы в системе правоохранительных органов специализированные подразделения по борьбе с преступлениями в сфере высоких технологий и совершение преступлений с использованием искусственного интеллекта, а также киберпреступлений. При поддержке офиса ОБСЕ запланированы и практически обучающие семинары для сотрудников этих подразделений по вопросам предотвращения преступлений с использованием возможностей искусственного интеллекта. Озвучивая вопросы просветительской деятельности и информированности наших трудовых мигрантов, хотелось бы отметить активную работу, проводимую по вопросам превентивного характера со стороны Совета по вопросам миграции и противодействия торговли людьми при спикере парламента Кыргызстана с нашей молодежью на местах и нашими диаспорами за пределами страны по недопущению фактов торговли людьми. Уважаемые коллеги, я хотел бы завершить свое выступление вновь, заявив о нашей приверженности продолжить диалог и сотрудничество на всех действующих площадках ОБСЕ. Благодарю вас за внимание. And uh, Ms. Kmelyova, survivor leader from Kazakhstan. And uh, the first on my list is Ms. Dong. Ms. Dong, you have the floor. Dr. Kelly Johnson, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as we gather here at this conference, it is imperative that we confront the stark realities of modern day slavery with unwavering resolve and a renewed commitment to action. Today, I stand before you not as a lived experience expert, but as a voice for the voiceless, bearing witness to the hearing tales of exploitation and abuse that plague our world. Born and raised in China, I was confronted with the harsh truth of human trafficking at an early age, when kids were told not to take candies from strangers who would exploit them into forced begging. Today, Women are being exploited into surrogacy with ba their babies being sold to rich families with proceeds going into the deep pockets of organized criminals. Organ traffickers slaughter victims for rich clients desperate for organs. Cyber trafficking fueled by technology, social media, and untraceable cryptocurrency perpetrates the exploitation of innocent children into online sexual performance, while forced marriage often condemns young girls to lives of servitude, physical violence, and sexual assault, let alone female genital mutation. The heart-wrenching reality underscored the need for coerced efforts to address this issue. Tackling gender discrimination and honor based abuse and kill, killing heads on. This polluted rivers, once thought to be contaminated with industrial waste, were instead teeming with bodies of abandoned girls. Upon moving to the United States, I noticed that Asian girls adopted by American couples were mostly there 
they were deemed undesirable, destined for abandonment. Sadly, these are not just stories we saw in movies or happening overseas only. These are happening in your backyards, through culturally specific communities, migrants, and refugees, and other minorities. As we sit here commemorates 21 years combating trafficking in human beings, we must center to our efforts to data-driven, evidence-based policy and program making a foundation upon which we can translate into tangible outcomes and build targeted interventions and strategic initiatives. While it is disturbing to see the increase of the percentage and the dollar amount of human trafficking data, the numbers not reported are far more concerning. It is story left untold, the voices silenced by fear, shame, and even death that truly underscore the urgency of our mission to improve the effectiveness of victim identification and building trust. While it is commendable to acknowledge the progress in educating our children about consent, many cultures do not traditionally emphasize this concept. Historically, women and girls were often seen as possessions of men, lacking agencies of their own bodies. This requires mechanisms to protect and support minority victims to come forward, educate these communities on awareness and human rights for prevention, hold perpetrators accountable with monetary sanctions to compensate victims and survivors, and establish partnership with multidisciplinary, intergenerational, cross-sector, holistic, and individualized approaches. For example, in Houston, Texas, where I'm based out of, we're working with oil and gas companies to prevent human trafficking in the supply chain. In closing, let us reaffirm our commitment to bridging the gaps for more impactful prevention in these culturally specific and minority communities. Together, we can foster a world free from abuse, exploitation, violence, and torture, leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dong. Uh, Ms. Kmeliova? Здравствуйте, меня зовут Анастасия Хмелева. Я являюсь членом консультативной группы выживших Винрек Интернешнл в рамках проекта Государственного департамента США по борьбе с торговлей детьми в Казахстане. Насколько мне известно, это единственная подобная, подобная группа в регионе Центральной Азии. Я надеюсь, что это только начало движения выживших в этой части ОБСЕ. Я благодарна за возможность присутствовать на мероприятии и услышать об инициативах различных правительств и гражданского общества по предотвращению торговли людьми. Я хотела бы поддержать рекомендацию Малайки о создании таких консультативных советов во всех странах. В своей работе по оказанию поддержки жертвам торговли людьми я столкнулась с новым типом ТЛ – эксплуатации посредством онлайн-бизнеса, связанной с веб-камингом. Торговцы людьми обычно ищут молодых девушек, которых продают свои фотографии за деньги, а затем подвергаются принуждению к половым актам. Важно проводить среди молодежи профилактику цифровой гигиены, чтобы повысить осведомленность о необходимости делиться конвенциальным контентом с другими. Также важно продолжать работать а, с компаниями, занимающимися соци... социальными сетями и компанией по обмену сообщениями для выявления пометки или удаления вредоносного контента. А, что касается факторов уязвимости, а, я согласна с утверждением, что инвалидность и более низкий со... социально-экономический уровень приводят а, к большей подверженности торговли людьми и их эксплуатации. Но, однако, важно не выделять и не сигматизировать такие группы как более слабые, чем другие, потому что жертвами могут стать люди любого статуса, о чем вчера говорилось. Спасибо.
Thank you, Ms. Meliova, for your uh, intervention. Uh, we have a difficult situation because uh, I have five speakers on my list in less than 15 minutes. So I would like to ask each of the uh, following speakers to really limit their interventions to two minutes. So each of you has a chance to, uh, to speak today. And I would like to start with Italy. Pause for the floor. Italy, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, dear colleague. Mm -hmm. Colleagues, first of all, uh, we would like to thank the panelists for the insightful discussion and to congratulate the special representative and their office for the successful event and for the pressure support in strengthening the national capacity of participating states in combating human trafficking. In line with what is this being discussed today, Italy's response to human trafficking is evolving to address existing and emerging trends emphasizing prevention and victim protection, while also focusing on addressing the root causes and vulnerabilities that contribute to trafficking activities. To effectively prevent trafficking in the specific context of mixed migration flows, the Italian government last year updated the national referral mechanism, including also a list of standard operating procedures with a specific focus on vulnerabilities. Moreover, the Department of Equal Opportunity is fostering coordination mechanisms to increase dedication, dedicating funding. As discussed, prevention efforts should be shaped according to recent trends, such as, for example, the increased number of unaccompanied minors coming from several countries. Another trend is related to the secondary movement of potential victims. And to these regards, I'd like now to give the floor to my colleague to provide a brief update on the research on secondary movement. Many thanks. Uh, Mrs. Olive and many thanks uh, to the OCE for giving us this opportunity to briefly present uh, the research that the IRES Piemont, uh, um, the research I belong to, uh, conduct on secondary movement of potential victims of trafficking within the European borders. For us, it was important to discuss it today because uh, it is related to prevention, data collection, and also to coordination mechanisms. In the last years, we observed uh, the increased number of mainly Nigerian move, uh, potential victims of trafficking moving from Italy after they applied for international protection and going to many European countries such as French and Germany. To this end, to, 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 uh, to, graph, to, to, fact, to better understand this phenomenon, we conducted a deep research involving the interviews of more than 101 stakeholders in Italy and in Germany. And uh, uh, we uh, tried to understand the reason why women moved from Italy to Germany and then they came back without the application of the Dublin regulation to Italy. The main findings of our research is that this uh, phenomenon is heterogeneous. It includes various nationalities, not only Nigerian, but also women from Ivory Coast and Guinea, and is characterized by various circumstances. In many cases, women have, uh, uh, have been exposed to further processes of re-victimization, included pregnancies as forms of exploitation and as a means of seeking regularization, and also claimings related to claiming social benefits in other European countries, which represent also, according to the last OCE reports, a new form of exploitation. In addition, minors of these women have been exposed to protection needs and vulnerabilities. From these insights, we would like to um, highlight the following key points, that specific groups with unique vulnerability require tailored protection measures and prevention initiative. And we would like to outline that utilizing cross-border referral mechanism and sharing information and data collection would represent an important step to foster protection and prevention. To conclude, we would like to extend our sincere gratitude to the special representative for their work and thank you for giving us the opportunity to share this, this research. Many thanks. I would like to thank uh, Italy for uh, your intervention. And uh, we have four more speakers that have asked for the floor uh, today, but unfortunately we're not gonna have time to, to hear them because I would like to give the floor to each of the panelists for at least two minutes each to, uh, to conclude the uh, the session, uh, but uh, Carrie has uh, kindly agreed to accept written statements from uh, the four organizations, which are the ASEAN Act, Slave Check Foundation, Hope for Justice, and Step Up, Stop Slavery, and uh, they can be put up on the uh, OSC website and on the meeting's website. 
and potentially speak at other panels. And maybe you know, potentially ask for the floor for another panels to uh, to make uh, to make your points. So without uh, further delay, I would like to ask Neri to start with a reverse order and ask Anu for her concluding remarks. But please stay within two minutes. We need to finish at eleven sharp. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, just to reflect uh, on the presentations or the or the feedback from the audience, uh, I could say that uh, one of the things in the prevention is also eagerly to look at the social media usage and, and also to look up the cases there. And for these purposes, uh, we at least have worked with uh, web constables, so police active in the social media. So this is one of the possibilities to reach the most vulnerable people and to stop uh, the further harm done there. So one of the ways and about the data collection, also it was uh, said a lot uh, in the audience, uh, it is needed to work with the different platforms and to, to have the intelligence uh, in, the, in the criminal investigation to, uh, to, to find the cases, to find the money and to work with that. So we also are dedicated to look for the better solutions there to use the artificial intelligence. So, so these are also couple of the um, future challenges for us to work with uh, in order to prevent trafficking. Thank you. Thanks, Anu. Kathy? Thank you. Um, I have two further thoughts for you. One is just to please remember that the reason we object to human trafficking is because it hurts people. And therefore, one of the things we need to be doing is moving beyond just prevalence figures when we're collecting data. I've heard a lot about data collection, which is fantastic. But if we're not collect collecting data on people's health and their risk factors and their what prevented further harm, then we're not gonna be able to focus on interventions and we're not also going to be able to then participate in those dialogues on the global burden of health um, by talking about human trafficking, which needs to be brought out into the health sector. In addition to that, when we talk about um, research, we need to be intervention focused. Again, not just prevalence, and not just survivors, but intervention focused. And that means that it means going beyond individual vulnerability. Of course, that's important. That's essential. But we need to look at the structures and the systems that are creating vulnerability and that are causing these processes so that people can't find the good jobs they want. And they're finding jobs that are harmful to them. Thank you, Kathy. Valentin? Yes, I think I owe you a, an answer to the question you asked before my after my presentation. So that was referring to the change of status of Romania becoming a destination country and our actions to prevent uh, the current challenges. And I think it's common sense to say that um, economical development brings the needs for jobs. For new jobs and i'm pleased to inform you that romania's uh, gdp more than doubled in the last 10 years and uh, nowadays romania is issuing more than 100,000 visas for foreign workers per year mainly for hospitality industry and constructions so um, our actions our future actions are foreseeing activities targeting supply chain and due diligence and i think uh, inspector labors have a key role in this also, uh, I want to highlight the importance of partnerships, especially with the diplomatic missions of the source countries. Added to that, we want to, to leverage the experience and best, best practices of others, other countries. And I want to exemplify here our great relationship with Great Britain and our joint action plan. It's uh, bringing into attention uh, activities towards uh, foreign uh, workers. Also, um, we have uh, in plan uh, collaboration with IOM. And here I want to exemplify now that Ukrainian refugees have access in Romania to a hotline that provides them uh, support in their native language. And added to that, we, we want to extend that with the support of IOM to all the languages that foreign workers use in Romania. Um, these are just a few of the actions we've foreseen. I hope uh, 
it's uh, it's optimistic enough to see that we are uh, prepared to to foresee the future uh, developments of of trafficking. Thank you very much, Valentin. It's I mean it's a fascinating subject too. Like, I mean we could talk here for four hours. Um, Shromis, the last. Thank you. Saving the best for last. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you all. It's really a pleasure and honor to come back and, and, and be in this panel with such amazing people doing incredible work and reminding us for why we are here. And ultimately, we're here because people are being exploited every single day in every single country. Um, and, um, and I think it's worth repeating the fact that it's happening here in Europe. People are coming, are being exploited uh, in Europe. And therefore, our, our, we need to evolve in our thinking and our ways. Uh, one of the things that th I have been passionate about uh, recently, it's about how minorities and other uh, other populations who are at risk are being exploited, whether anywhere from being from bright kidnapping to uh, people being forced to pick tomatoes in the south of uh, in the south of Europe. Uh, these are things that where we need the full efforts of the private sector. We need them at this table. We need the political will from from each of each member state to put pressure on businesses to uh, take up uh, practices. They are they, they are rooted in human rights. They are rooted in, 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 uh, in workers' rights uh, so that workers can, in, uh, can um, have better access to jobs. And then we'll be able to tackle some of the social determinants of health uh, that put people at higher risk of human trafficking. And we know these from people who are in the move. We know these from people who are of color and LGBTQ folks uh, in minority groups in, in, in Europe who are being exploited at alarming numbers. Um, we, we need your political will at every single point at a single at every uh, at every effort that we're doing uh, it's an invitation uh, to you to uh, please uh, uh, the collaboration and that fact that we we can't just wait for that what the annual conference uh, alliance conference for us to do something we have to do something every single year we have to put pressure and businesses alike and we need to a political will to make change and that's the only way Europe is going to eradicate trafficking. It's only if you all work together and come together to to uh, to better the conditions of workers and better the conditions for victims of human trafficking. Thank you. Thanks, Hermes. And uh, I think this uh, concludes the session. From my side, I want to thank Gary very much for this opportunity. It's been a pleasure to moderate this distinguished panel of, of experts and and colleagues and, and 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 all of you thanks for your contributions i think we can uh, we can release you now for your coffee break and we're back at we are back at uh 11 30. at 11 30 we'll be back at 11 30 for the next session thank you very much Good, very good. The interpreters will be your biggest fans. <laughs> I know that. Okay, I know they said we have these ones. But you know, now that the um, that the budget is not going to end, they actually stop everything. Not even that; it's really work. So we have to stop at six. Turn the microphone on.
Can we ask everyone to take your seats, please, so we can get started? So we're now going to begin. Thank you all for coming back uh, to the room. We are now going to begin our moderator led talk. So the format for this session is a little different from the other panels and the conversation will focus uh, up here at the panelists rather than um, speakers from the floor. It's a shorter panel for that reason uh, before we turn to lunch. So without further ado, I will turn to our moderator, uh, Ambassador Hatun Demirir of Turkey. Thank you, Kari. Distinguished participants, I have the honor and pleasure uh, to moderate this session entitled up close on prevention. Human trafficking is an evolving crime that increasingly intersects with different other crimes and manifests itself in different forms and types. Trafficking is a borderless crime, increasingly so with the use of internet through which victims are recruited and exploited. One of the acute concerns of preventing and addressing various forms of human trafficking is the emergence of new forms of trafficking that blur the lines between victims and perpetrators. Trafficking for criminal activity or forced criminality of both adults and children is rapidly growing across the OSC region and globally. This form of exploitation often results in victims being penalized instead of their traffickers. For example, OAC's 2021 survey noted a significant increase in the rate of forced criminality, which increased from 276 reported cases in 2018 in 1,394 in 2019, and further to 1,748 at the time of reporting in 2020. In percentage terms, this is an increase from 2% 2, 2 of all cases to 24%. Likewise, the UNODC 2022 global report showed an increase in this form of exploitation. These data points to the urgent need to critically review our prevention efforts and to improve the response. What does it mean for the current anti-trafficking responses, particularly for prevention efforts? In this talk, we will try to shed light on this issue together with our distinguished panelists. So I will introduce them one by one shortly, and then we will dive into our discussion. First, Ms. Sandra Polak is a jurist and unfortunately was trafficked in Germany. The trafficking started when she was minor. After exiting her trafficking situation, Ms. Norak decided to study law and passed the second state examination in law in Germany this year. She pursues the goal of enlightening society and of influencing legislation on the subject as well as getting better help for victims. She speaks as an expert on the subject in political debates, takes part in parliamentary events, and is giving lectures. We are honored for your participation in our panel. Our, another speaker is Ms. Katrin Chon, is the founding director of the Office on Trafficking in Persons and senior advisor on human trafficking at the US Department of Health and Human Services. OTIP is responsible for developing strategies and implementing programs to prevent trafficking, increase victim identification and access to services, and strengthen the health and well-being of survivors. As director, Ms. Chon leads the office, determines the eligibility of services for survivors of human trafficking, and supports the HHS task force to prevent human trafficking. As senior advisor, Ms. Chon serves 
on multiple federal working groups on human trafficking, gender-based violence, child exploitation, and resilient supply chains. She is the Federal Executive Officer of Public-Private Collaborations, including the National Advisory Committee on the Trafficking of Children and Youth in the U.S. and the Joint Forced Labor Working Group. Welcome to our panel. Mr. Hobbs, Nick Hobbs, is Head of Advice and Investigations for the Office of Children and Young People's Commissioners, Scotland. Nick leads a team whose role is to exercise the Commissioner's legal powers of investigation into violations of children's rights and to engage in strategic litigation on key, key children's rights issues. Prior to joining the Commissioner's Office in 2017, Nick spent 11 years as Policy and Public Affairs Manager for the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration. In this role, he worked on ensuring the organization could positively influence law and policy on issues including human trafficking, youth justice, and child protection. And our last speaker is from Australia, Mr. William Legge, is the program coordinator for policy, partnership, and capacity development at the Regional Support Office of the Bali Process on people smuggling, trafficking in persons, and related transnational crime. He oversees RSOs, tech countering trafficking in persons, transnational crime and technology, and countering people smuggling programs. Will comes with broad experience of the Australian Department of Home Affairs in the immigration and border security space, where he held a variety of roles across areas such as refugee and humanitarian compliance and risk management, including working in Shanghai, China, where he focused on organized immigration crime and related trafficking. So, short CV summary. I will directly dive into our discussion and uh, give the floor first uh, our speaker, Mr. Nick Hobbs from Scotland, UK. Nick, trafficking of children and youth for exploitation in criminal activities are one of the acute problems facing states today. In the UK, particularly in Scotland, the share of children exploited in drug-related offences, such as county lines, has been on the rise, as far as we know. Can you tell us more about this phenomenon and where do you think we should focus to prevent this alarming fact? The floor is yours. Good morning and thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you today. Um, I'm talking specifically from a children's rights perspective. Our office is an independent children's rights institution in terms of the UN Paris principles. And so that's where our focus is in relation to, to all of our work, um, and in this case, trafficking. I'm going to talk mostly about Scotland, but I will refer to UK legislation and policy where it affects children in Scotland. And what I'm going to say is based on our own work, but also on work by the Children and Young People's Centre for Justice, the recently published J Review uh, and data from the Scottish Guardianship Service. Now, there are broadly two groups that we're concerned about in relation to child criminal exploitation. There are children trafficked internally via what's called uh, County Lines model, which is where children are being used to do the very riskiest criminal activities for organised gangs, so moving drugs or weapons, long distances, collecting drug debt. And the majority of those children are UK nationals uh, and they're trafficked within the United Kingdom. We're also really concerned, though, about unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, uh, trafficking victims who are dispersed to Scotland via a national transfer scheme after arriving elsewhere in the United Kingdom or sometimes who arrive directly in Scotland. And the first problem that we have uh, in, in identifying and addressing this issue is data. So there's no universal definition uh, in law or in policy. Uh, about what child criminal exploitation means, and it's not well or consistently recorded, uh, partly as a consequence. So we have some data from the National Referral Mechanism, some from Police Scotland, but that data doesn't always tie together. So we know it's a problem, but the scale of the problem isn't as clear as it needs to be. What we do know is that in 2023, there were almost 7,500 referrals relating to children made to the National Referral Mechanism of which just over 300 were for Scotland, and that's probably a bit less than we would expect. And the most common reason for referral, accounting for 42%, was for criminal exploitation. So we've got a sense that it's a big a big problem. In terms of the children affected, 
The average age was 15.8, but there is evidence of children of primary age, so, so between about 5 to 10 years old, being targeted as well. It's mostly boys, and we're seeing children from black and minority ethnic communities overrepresented in the stats. And as I said, the majority of them are UK nationals, but we're seeing children with insecure immigration status being particularly vulnerable to this kind of exploitation. Other vulnerabilities include being in care, um, children who are excluded from education, uh, and children who are homeless uh, or living in poverty. And as you would expect, some of those overlap and intersect. In terms of techniques used by the traffickers, um, there are a lot of comparisons to be drawn with child sexual exploitation. So we see uh, grooming being used, so the use of financial relationships or sometimes romantic relationships in order to draw children into exploitative situations. The traffickers abusing the imbalance of power that exists between adults and children uh, and particular vulnerabilities that children experience. And we also see the use of children who've been exploited to exploit others in turn. So in terms of tackling it, it's important to consider the child's contact with a wide range of systems that can either act in a protective way uh, and help to prevent or mitigate um, child criminal exploitation and support the fight against trafficking, or sometimes can, can get in the way um, or can actively undermine children's safety. Within our child protection system, historically, we've been very focused on harm within the family environments. And so there's evidence that we're not always recognizing children as victims or as potential victims of criminal exploitation. And even where we do, the national referral mechanism, the mechanism through which we're supposed to identify victims, is subject to huge delays. So the average time for a conclusive grounds decision is 530 days, which is a huge, huge period in the life of a child. And there's lots of concern that too often a criminal justice response takes precedence over child protection. So if you're not recognized or if there are delays to being recognized as a victim, you're more likely to be exposed to the justice system for a longer period of time. And that can have a really significant impact on children's rights. And we've seen in the past Vietnamese child trafficking victims uh, imprisoned, sent to prison. That's not only a human rights breach in terms of the individual child, um, but it also reduces the ability to successfully identify and prosecute the real offenders and discharge the state's obligation to protect children from harm. Within education, we're seeing issues around the, the ongoing impact of, of the COVID pandemic, of disconnection of children from education. And we know that exclusion is a risk factor, but I don't think we're properly joining up and considering the risks of um, exclusion for what's currently being being talked about a lot as poor behavior within schools, but which I think has a, a root cause in, in COVID um, and in developmental issues. And the UK has a particular issue uh, with immigration law and policy. So just in the last three years, we've passed legislation that places child trafficking victims at increased risk of harm and further exploitation. For some reason, we've chosen to, to gold plate the business model for criminal gangs in relation to those children. And that's on top of the well-reported failures of the Home Office to keep them safe. Almost 400 children missing from Home Office hotels and the last figures, almost 150 still missing and real concerns that some have ended up in the hands of organised crime. Uh, and the less said about the Rwanda bill, which is going through Parliament at the moment, the better. I don't want to be to be wholly negative. There is good work going on, and I'll, I'll touch on some of it perhaps in, in the answer to one of the following questions. But I, I want to end this initial contribution with the voices of trafficked, refugee and asylum seeking children. So the children that I've met and worked with talk about a culture of disbelief that they say permeates the system um, that characterizes their experience. So disbelief about their status as children disbelief about their status as refugees and disbelief about their status of trafficking victims. And so they see and they hear the way that UK government ministers talk about refugees and asylum seekers. They hear that anti-immigrant rhetoric. They see rhetoric about the abuse, uh, unevidenced rhetoric about abuse of the national referral mechanism. And they see legislation being passed that makes them and others like them less safe. Uh, and they have a right to expect far more from us. Um, and hopefully in the in the next session, I'll have a chance to talk about um, what I think we should be doing in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Now I turn to Sandra. Uh, before posing a question uh, as a short remark, uh, while trafficking is an evolving crime with criminals finding different ways, sex trafficking remains a prevalent form and lockdown a few years ago 
created severe vulnerabilities for those most at risk and helping to create the next generation of human trafficking victims that are trafficked and exploited in various ways. As Secretary Special Representative Johnston uh, mentioned in her opening remarks, there is a high demand for all forms of trafficking in the OIC region and combating the demand that attracts traffickers in our region is about so much more than just reducing the reward. It is also about preventing the immense harm suffered by their victims. So as an expert with lived experience and uh, an advocate for reducing the demand that fuels sexual exploitation, where do you see main gaps and challenges in our efforts to discourage demand? The floor is yours, Sandra. Dear Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, first I want to say thank you that I'm able to speak here to the OSCE and to the special representative. And first I want to speak shortly um, about trafficking for sexual exploitation and prostitution because this is what happened, what happened to myself and because of one other important aspect. As you said, demand is a core driver not only for trafficking for sexual exploitation, but nowhere demand is more direct than in the case of trafficking for sexual exploitation, especially when it comes to prostitution, because there is no separation between the exploited victim and the end user. And as OSCE demands paper or the paper on demand highlights, users cause acute harm to victims, both by incentivizing trafficking in the first place and then through the sexual act itself. The buyer causes direct harm to the victim by sexually assaulting and raping it. This is why there needs to be a special focus on this kind of demand. And I want to thank the OSCE, OSCE also that this started to happen with the paper on demand, discouraging demand that fosters um, trafficking for sexual exploitation. And I cannot say it often enough how important it is to focus on this topic. OSCE points also out in this paper that there are actually three legislative approaches where, discourage, uh, where demand can be discouraged. First, it is criminalizing the knowing use of services of a trafficking victim. Second, it's criminalizing the use of all trafficking victims in the form of strict liability. And um, the third is criminalizing all sex buying. In Germany, where I come from and where I was trafficked, we have model number one, criminalizing the knowing use of services of a trafficking victim and also criminalizing the recklessness use of a trafficking victim. But we have almost no convictions and many trafficking victims and a very high demand because of our legal system. We have advertising of prostitution, promoting prostitution. There are also, for example, flyers made by state authorities that are given to persons officially when they are registered for working in prostitution with the headline love rules. And you know that you can never know when a person registered if this is a trafficking victim or not, but they get this flyer in one town of Germany by state authorities. And I think no matter which legislation on the topic we prefer, we all know that prostitution has nothing to do with love. So, but this normalizing and trivializing is automatically happening when you make a job out of it. And with this, the demand is not discouraged, but encouraged to grow, which is a violation of the Palermo Protocol, which says that we have to discourage demand that fosters all forms of trafficking. So what I have experienced, not only by myself, but what I have also seen with others is that a legal prostitution system is a push factor for trafficking. So in my opinion, the main gap is that not all countries do it, like for example, France or Sweden, with criminalizing the buying and the profiting because therefore it results that buyers can switch between countries and there is no real restriction. But I also know that this topic is very controversial and there are also things you can do when you have a legal system, like in Germany. What can you do? For example, we have Article 9, Section 5 in the Palermo Protocol that doesn't only say that, say that states' parties shall adopt legislative measures to discourage demand, but also educational, social, 
and cultural measures to discourage demand that fosters all forms of trafficking. And therefore, not only demand for trafficking is meant, but also the demand for prostitution, because the demand for prostitution also fosters trafficking. So states have to establish measures and which I find most important educational and social measures that enlightens about the reality of trafficking, of prostitution, the danger, the criminality, because victims have, or potential victims have the right to be warned and to know what maybe can await them so that they are better able to protect themselves. Because if they don't know anything, it's much more harder to protect yourself from trafficking and exploitation. So this normalization we have, for example, in Germany, also affects other and new or emerging forms of trafficking, which is also the focus of this conference in these days. And I want to tell you shortly about one other form or new form of trafficking I recognized in Germany. Um, and this case is from last year, and there is a network who have an official homepage, which you can still find in the internet, where they sell online courses to men with the title Soul Locked, The Loss of Love. So there were documentations about this network that men learn in this course, other men, how to make women emotionally dependent on them. In these documentaries, the victims testified that they were first made emotionally dependent and then exploited we are only fans. So they have to make sexual content, pornographic content with which they have been exploited. So this is actually similar like lover boy or Romeo trafficking. First, an emotional relationship is established by the trafficker and then like with the lover boy method, the person is then exploited in prostitution and here exploited via only fans, pornographic material. So there was also one former member of this network who says he took 50% of the income and there were other men who took more than 50% of the income. The victims testified in this documentary that they were pressured to and forced to do this OnlyFans account. But this website still exists. You can find it in the internet. It's still online and they go on with their work. So... What I want to say with this is that not only buyers feel safe, but also traffickers or potential traffickers, because in a state where this is legal, law enforcement has, it's much more difficult for law enforcement to investigate what is illegal. Because, for example, in Germany, it's legal to take about 50% of the prostituted person or of the you know person who is doing this pornographic stuff. So um, traffickers and buyers actually hide behind a legal system where people think it's better controllable. But I can say from my experience and from the lot from the experience from a lot of other victims, it's not. I personally was trafficked in legal brothels. I know many other, and I have seen many others that were also trafficked in legal brothels where police come in, but was not able to do anything. At some point I was even registered, which my trafficker allowed. And I don't know if this is a new strategy, but traffickers use the strategy also that they allow to register or even to pay a few taxes because this results in that the exploitation is not um, noticed or maybe it's better hidden because people think and also a lot of authorities think that if you are a victim of exploitation and of trafficking, you can't be registered and you can't pay taxes, but this is wrong. So we have to see that traffickers will not be stopped by regulations. Traffickers can only be stopped or slowed down when we take away their fuel, and their fuel is demand. And I have not the illusion that demand, demand can be eradicated fully, but Nevertheless, that demand will always exist. This is not an excuse to say demand will always exist and we cannot do against we cannot do something against this because I am sure that we can when we 
establish good implementation measures that discourage demand. And those who have not done this, I recommend to implement measures that discourage demand because this is actually one of the most important prevention measures that trafficking will not even happen to victims because if it happened, then it's actually too late. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. I now turn to... I now turn to you. Uh, trafficking of particularly adults for committing fraud and scam continues at alarming pace and also affects our region. The Bali process has been in the center of actions to address this growing phenomenon. How are trafficking networks adapting their modus operandi and capitalizing on increased vulnerabilities to commit this form of trafficking? The floor is yours, please. Thank you, Ambassador, and for the, thank you for the question, and also to the OSCE, OSCE for inviting me to this wonderful event. Um, I thought I'd start by uh, providing a brief outline of how these organised crime groups operate, which will help provide some context about how they've been able to capitalise on these vulnerabilities and adapt their modus operandi to very rapidly expand uh, the scale of cyber scam centres. So the majority of the large cyber scam centres are located in Southeast Asian countries such as Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, Laos, the Philippines, and they are run by transnational organised crime groups originating from China, predominantly from China and Taiwan. These groups have been facilitating and prof profiting from transnational human trafficking for decades. So they are highly experienced and skilled with extensive networks throughout the world and are able to operate essentially like companies. The criminal components of their operations are decentralised, meaning individuals or groups provide specialised services to enable scam centres to operate and be profitable. Uh, this also makes them incredibly hard to disrupt. Services include the recruitment and trafficking, of course, of people for forced criminality, cyber scam enabling services, such as uh, the development of scripts for scamming individuals that can then be shared, uh, the trading of established active social media profiles, and of course, money laundering services. Uh, it's important to understand that these services are not only provided for human trafficking, uh, but a full range of criminality, demonstrating the polycriminality of these groups. In the cyber scam centres themselves, the, two, the, the scams are divided into two main uh, types. One is called a quick kill. These take, take hours to days to uh, scam victims and are most likely, and, and scam victims are most likely to use hundreds to maybe thousands of dollars, uh, US dollars that is. So for example, sporting bet fraud, merchandise refunds, sextortion. Uh, and the larger ones are your calculated, what they call calculated conversations. These are your cryptocurrency uh, and investment scam frauds, your romance scams, sometimes referred to as pig, pig butchering scams, which is a pretty horrible term. Uh, and these are the ones that create longer term relationships and can result in thousands to millions of dollars in losses. So when the COVID pandemic brought the world to a standstill, these groups were these organised crime groups were left with a large number of empty casinos, particularly in the Mekong region in Southeast Asia, uh, that are located in largely in special economic zones um, in the Golden Triangle, uh, as well as in other areas. The casinos played an important role in generating profit, of course, from both gambling but also from the laundering of proceeds of crime from various illicit activities. But as people were forced uh, to move increasingly online for work and socialisation, these organised crime groups took advantage of this vulnerability and used it as an opportunity to expand the sh uh, from solely running casinos to scaling up their existing cyber scam centre operations, which were much smaller in scale uh, before the before COVID. So, in order to staff these new and much larger cyber scam centres. Organised crime groups needed large numbers of people with requisite IT skills. And it's this shift that we've seen a new victim profile and has been discussed already, where 
uh, victims are being trafficked into forced criminality. Uh, and these victims are well educated, often well educated, come from stable homes and even economic circumstances, uh, but they could have been trafficked or they've largely been trafficked uh, based on false or misleading employment uh, opportunities. Now, when we talk of adaptations to trafficking, mo uh, trafficking modus operandi, I think it's important we differentiate between trafficking techniques and the tools that enable trafficking groups to profit from human trafficking. The trafficking techniques these networks are using, such as recruitment, debt bondage, uh, physical threats, have not really changed and would be readily recognisable in all sorts of other uh, trafficking forms. It's the growth and the new form of criminality, be it cyber scam centres, or cyber scams, I should say, that has meant trafficking networks have adapted the tools they use. So they're bringing in social media, using communication apps, money laundering services and cryptocurrency. Uh, and they've developed new ways of trafficking and uh, identified new types of trafficking victims. Um, it's these tools that are enabling organized crime groups to traffic people on unprecedented scales from across the globe. To date, the RSO um, has identified reporting of victims from at least 60 countries being trafficked into cyber scam centers in Southeast Asia. Uh, that would be, and that's just the Southeast Asian ones. There are scam centers all over the world. Uh, with this kind of reach is something that has not traditionally been possible as trafficking groups would tend to have relied, transnational uh, organized crime groups that are trafficking have tend to have relied on existing networks based in source countries. Uh, to recruit and facilitate the movement. Uh, estimates put the number of people to have been trafficked in, into countries such as Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos and Philippines in the hundreds of thousands since 2021. Uh, to give you an understanding of how these groups are using these new tools to adapt their modus operandi, um, I'll briefly outline the recruitment process, how people are moved uh, and then how people are kept in situations of forced criminality. Recruitment is largely initiated online, but uh, it is also initiated by people who've already been trafficked into scam centres uh, who are then who then recruit family or friends in order to escape their situation of trafficking. Uh, advertisements on social media for fake or misleading jobs with good salaries, often based overseas, entice people to apply. Um, you know, you're talking about a situation where jobs just disappeared. So all of a sudden, these attractive offers were very attractive. Um, the roles advertised are not always for scamming jobs, uh, but can include things like sex work and even roles relating to maintaining the scam, you know, the maintenance of the centres. International travel is a key vulnerability, uh, and the networks exploit this. They organise and pay for trafficking victims' travel and accommodation, which really is the first stage of debt bondage. Travel to a foreign co country obviously puts people in. Uh, in a highly vulnerable position. Literally everyone in this room who travels to a foreign country is in a vulnerable position. As you don't understand the laws properly, the language, or even how to seek help. Once inside the scam centre compounds, victims are forced to scam people and are effectively held in captivity uh, with threats of violence for failing to meet targets uh, not uncommon. And we've also, uh, we also know that people have been killed. Uh, and another really important adaptation we're observing is really what can only be described as the introduction of slave trading. Trafficking networks need to maintain a strong supply of workers, and given the scale of some of these operations, it is very, it's unsurprising to see people being bought and sold via communication platforms. Uh, people are traded based on their skill sets, whether scam related or other services. Uh, disturbingly, we've also seen evidence of individuals advertising their availability to, to the scam centre operators, uh, including their willingness to accept confinement in order to secure employment and be able to provide fin financially for their family. And I think this uh, goes back to um, Cathy Zimmerman's comments around, you know, the what are those incentives driving people into these uh, situations of trafficking? So organised crime groups are also increasingly using AI in all aspects of cyber scam centre operations, including recruitment. Uh, particularly large language uh, models like Google Gemini or ChatGPT, uh, they enable transnational crime groups to use translation capabilities to develop targeted recruitment messaging that appeals to specific populations. 
This also reduces the need for multilingual staff engaged in the recruitment process, making it far more efficient, less resource intensive, and therefore making recruitment more effective as recruiters are able to respond quickly in multiple languages. Uh, it allows recruiters to expand their reach, reduce their response times, um, and as the recruitment language is more customised, it therefore becomes more convincing to potential victims. <clears throat> And just to finish, just some of the other vulnerabilities we see them take advantage of. Weak law enforcement responses make cyber scam centres and related trafficking a hugely low risk, high reward crime. Penalties are negligible in comparison to crimes like drug trafficking, and there's minimal risk of being caught or prosecuted. Corruption continues to play a key enabler of trafficking into scam centres. The growth of special economic zones attracts organised crimes, uh, crime groups due to the um, generous tax incentives and reduced scrutiny they offer. And finally, uh, I want to mention the ex exploitation of visa and citizenship programs, uh, often referred to as golden visas. So these have been frequently used by, your, uh, by senior organised crime entities to avoid detection and set up criminal operations in countries they may not have been able to previously. It also allows a greater freedom of movement. So if they're placed on watch lists, all of a sudden they have a new passport, potentially even a new name. So for example, uh, recently in Singapore, there was a $2.2 billion money laundering case involving 10 Chinese nationals who also happened to hold passports from Cambodia, Vanuatu, Cyprus, and Dominica, all known golden visa, golden citizenship countries. China does not recognize dual citizenship. So what it demonstrates is how Criminal entities are able to exploit those migration and citizenship as systems to facilitate their illegal enterprises. And while it's a significant vulnerability, it also provides an opportunity to identify some of those more key um, entities in, in those networks as those who have access to that kind of, um, that kind of uh, passport uh, are more likely to be of senior status in, in those organisations. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Now I turn to our last speaker, uh, Katrin. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has just adopted the U.S. prevention framework. Uh, what are the priorities of that framework uh, and how does it address emerging trends? Oops. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the OSCE, to Special Representative Johnstone for having us here. As our Ambassador Dyer reflected earlier, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, earlier this year, we released this uh, National Human Trafficking Prevention Framework. It sounds very easy, but it was more than 10 years in the making. Often, even within government public health circles, um, when we've talked about human trafficking prevention, sometimes the um, responses are like, oh, prevention is so diffuse and it could be so indirect. Uh, do we need to solve all of poverty to, um, uh, to prevent human trafficking? It's so overwhelming. Let's focus on services and victims because that's countable and we can measure it. Um, so it took us about 10 years uh, to have discussions internally uh, to learn from uh, the breadth and depth of research in the international community and from uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, what we what really helped us uh, make the leap is recognizing that human trafficking does not exist in a vacuum. Uh, there has uh, there is existing uh, literature for decades around effective violence prevention strategies in domestic violence, child maltreatment, community violence, um, youth suicide, and other forms of um, interpersonal uh, violence. And so what we did was look at uh, the best available evidence on preventing other forms of violence, um, see what we can adapt uh, in the anti-trafficking field, and then rec also recognizing that there are very unique circumstances, risks, and pro protective factors that um, are different in trafficking compared to other forms of violence. And so uh, what we did was we looked at the connections between these various forms of violence. Uh, we looked at the literature, we talked with people with lived experience and 
um, held many community roundtables and listening sessions. Uh, what the framework does is it addresses both the prevention of perpetrating and offending behavior. So Sandra, thank you so much for your comments on demand, um, as well as uh, preventing victimization and exploitation. It outlines eight strategies, 32 approaches, gives very concrete examples what any individual, family, community organization, uh, multilateral body can do. We all can do something in the prevention arena, and this framework uh, provides a um, uh, provides many examples and helps to make something that seems so overwhelming and diffuse very concrete. The next steps for the Department of Health and Human Services is then turning this the principles and strategies and approaches in the framework into collective action, identifying a subset of the strategies and approaches that uh, we are going to commit to as a department through collaborations and partnerships um, across the federal government, hopefully through multilateral efforts as well. And, um, and then when it comes to emerging trends, the the type of analysis that we're um, welcoming um, others take in looking at the prevention framework is um, in terms of public, when we talk about the public health response, there are four very formulaic components. Uh, again, trying to make something as complex and overwhelming as trafficking into something more digestible. So from what we mean by a public health response is um, having the capacity to define and monitor the problem. Um, identifying the risk and protective factors as we've done throughout the session so far, developing and testing interventions, and then getting to widespread adoption. We're not really at the widespread adoption, um, and we're barely at the developing and testing, as Dr. Zimmerman mentioned about the need to have more R&D type efforts. Um, and in many cases, we're in the defining and monitoring. Uh, but one of the uh, reasons this approach makes it so much more practical is because we can be predictive of many of these evolving ways of traffickers and how they recruit, what their schemes are, where they're doing it, um, in part by looking at the economic um, factors, the market uh, factors, uh, the social norms that facilitate some of the more common forms of trafficking. And while we have so far really looked at the risk factors and protective factors at the individual level, what the framework is encouraging us to do is look beyond the individual, uh, the relational, and more at the societal, including the market-driven level. So for example, uh, many of the forms of labor trafficking that have been discussed, um, I question for all of us, how resilient are our various industries to human trafficking? So when there's a natural disaster, it is very predictable what happens after a natural disaster. Someone needs to come in, remove the debris. There are construction efforts, usually in tight timeframes with low costs, and those are the economic uh, factors that, and dynamics that can facilitate then traffickers coming in uh, through labor brokers, recruitment fees, et cetera, to supply the workforce. And so if we are in positions of looking at contracts uh, post-disaster um, in construction efforts, uh, there are contracting and due diligence mechanisms that we can use to help prevent human trafficking. Um, and also, I think yesterday someone mentioned it's not just low-skilled workforces, but for example, teaching, nursing, um, healthcare, other um, uh, sectors in the healthcare, uh, and uh, direct care services. Families in the United States and around the world have child care needs, elder care needs, home health needs. But if you look at all the statistics, the needs, the demand for these types of services compared to the workforce, there is a very wide gap and that gap is projected to widen even more domestically and globally. Are we prepared uh, for the known workforce shortages and the predictability of um, exploitative uh, schemes to come in and um, uh, bring in trafficked labor? 
And then this is the same thing in any criminal enterprise. Uh, we have seen in situations um, involving child labor, and there's a side event uh, where, where we will discuss this a little bit more, but uh, forced criminality, again, very predictable about uh, what transnational organized crime and other criminal enterprises are looking for and uh, what how they're going about recruiting. So um, the benefit of looking at the, um, the prevention framework is having the analytical tools to not just look at how do we strengthen the resiliency at the individual level, skills-based, educational, making sure people know about uh, their rights, being able to have the means to communicate to the appropriate officials, uh, to uh, access services, decreasing the shame and stigma, to increase help-seeking behavior, but really looking at those macro level, um, at the systems level, we have the data, it is very predictable, and the question really is, um, are we building our own, the resiliency of our own systemic response uh, to be able to prevent trafficking in all the known areas? Uh, I'll stop there and turn it back over to the monitor, moderator. Thank you, Katrin. Um, I wish we could have longer time, but we have to squeeze to one hour and we don't have much time. We have only seven minutes. I was I was planning to ask a second question to all our speakers, but we don't have time for that. But uh, I can do what uh, I can give the floor to each speaker uh, one by one, and if they have a specific comment recommendation on this occasion, uh, it will be useful for us. So I will begin again this time with uh, Sandra. Uh, Sandra, floor is yours. If you have any recommendation to us. Yes, maybe shortly to um, prevention measures. It's what I said already before is that f I find it very important that states implement measures that discourage demand action plans, maybe a national action plan, um, public campaigns, anything that helps building consciousness and awareness in um, society. And what I also find very important is that um, young people are more enlightened about trafficking, maybe in schools, some police are doing this already, but it's not enough. And um, it's also for law enforcement, um, for example, necessary to educate law enforcement more when it comes to the special mechanisms of trafficking and um, for example when it comes to sexual exploitation and trauma bonding because what i see and experience by myself is that a lot of victims of sexual exploitation um, are in relationships with the perpetrators if this is family or the partners and um, law enforcement often doesn't understand these mechanisms and to help victims out to prevent them from re-trafficking and to prevent them from further trafficking. Um, those who help have to understand what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Now I turn to Nick. Uh, floor is yours, Nick. Thank you. I'll, I'll try and pick sort of three things maybe. So uh, First of all, from from the point of view of taking a human rights based approach, it's really important to treat children as children and as rights holders. Everyone under the age of, under the age of eighteen is a child. Article one of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Secondly, I think it's it's critical that we we recognise and treat child criminal exploitation as a form of child abuse, which engages the state obligation to protect children from harm. And there are lots of similarities with with other forms of abuse. Catherine talked about about learning lessons from from work done in other sectors, and particularly we need to learn the very hard lessons uh, from how poorly historically child sexual exploitation has been tackled. That's improved, but still still some way to go. The the issues around power imbalances and grooming techniques, not blaming children for making bad choices, um, not seeing um, monetary. Uh, or other inducements as, as benefits, but as part of the grooming process. Um, and remembering that just because the child doesn't think they've been exploited, it doesn't mean that, that exploitation isn't isn't part of that. The other bit, I think, um, is to say that that we really need to, to make sure that we're aligning law and policy. So seeing child criminal exploitation as an issue which is cross-cutting, making sure that law and policy in other areas doesn't undermine the fight against trafficking. So looking at education, how do we support children to remain engaged in education, seeing that as a protective factor, 
looking at socioeconomic policies, drivers of, of poverty and mitigations, looking at the care system, the justice system, um, adherence to the non-punishment principle, uh, and looking at the the immigration system as well. So at the very least, don't don't use other law and policy to undermine the protections for trafficked children, because that's an absolute gift to, to serious organized criminals. Thank you. I thank you, Nick. And I turn to Will. Uh, I think when we're thinking about prevention um, or preventing human trafficking in scam centres, you cannot look at trafficking in isolation. Uh, the key to dismantling scam centres and any other organised crime um, activity like this is in targeting the areas where they are weak and developing effective intervention strategies. Uh, this aligns with early, earlier advocacy we heard about focusing on strategies that are sector specific. Um, so for cyber scam centres, for example, you, know, you need to make the business unprofitable. So if you want to stop human trafficking into scam centres, make it unprofitable. Uh, and for example, what do centres need to, um, to actually exist? They need power, they need internet connectivity, some of these really basic kind of fundamental uh, things that we can be doing. So are there ways to in target infrastructure uh, or disrupt their ability to operate and make it unprofitable and therefore de-incentivize the trafficking side of, our, side of that um, business? Um, they obviously need to be able to recruit and traffic large numbers of people. Can we develop targeted and relevant campaigns in source, transit, destination countries that will have an impact? How do... Uh, uh, how to disrupt trafficking networks' ability to transport their victims as well. You know, what can we do to intervene there? So I think one of the key changes required to improve prevention of human trafficking is the need to break down those national and regional silos and encourage globalised responses to trafficking that are sp um, sector-specific. The, the, um, the actions that can be taken um, to counter trafficking for forced criminality are not going to be the same that you use for surrogacy. Uh, and the responses must be collaborative, focusing on the impact and include everyone, your policy, law enforcement, judiciary, social services, NGOs, and the private sectors. Um, you know, in terms of the scale of scam centres, even just this week, we've seen reports from Zambia of 77 people being arrested for operating a scam centre. 22 of them were Chinese nationals. Uh, I think the Zambian um, citizens thought they were just working in a call centre. Um, and though we still don't have independent corroboration, the RSO has also heard of scam centres uh, operating. And we heard earlier in, in the OSCE region, so Ukraine, Russia, Montenegro, Georgia. Um, so in this global environment, I think there's a need for global uh, efforts to align and improve screening processes uh, ahead of the border as well. Uh, it's not just at the border where there is very limited opportunity to intervene in trafficking cases at the border, push that further upstream, using data-driven solutions to identify persons uh, that are, are at risk of trafficking before they enter a country will prevent many from being trafficked. But of course, there are plenty of solutions before they even get to travel as well. So uh, I'll leave it there in the interest of time. Yes. Um, okay, so three points for consideration. One, from a funding perspective, I mean, we're uh, part of a whole of government approach here uh, in the United States, but our department, we have our annual budget for human trafficking is 30 million. Our annual budget for various child protection programs runs in the billions. And so what we've worked to do and uh, consideration for anyone else is strengthening um, the way we integrate human trafficking prevention into all of these other uh, systems and programs. So if you're training healthcare providers on child maltreatment or domestic violence, tag on human trafficking. If you're working with schools on um, ref uh, referring child abuse use tag on human trafficking so that wherever there is any touch point in the community that addresses overlapping risk factors, uh, potential uh, protective factors, tag on trafficking because that the amount that is just dedicated to trafficking in the U.S. and around the world is so limited. Um, and so that's why the integration approach is really important from a funding perspective. Um, second point um, is actually more of a question. 
if we know through the scale of technology that traffickers are very proactively recruiting, grooming, et cetera, online at scale, at the millions, is there a way for us to get there, get to the individuals that the traffickers are targeting before the traffickers get there? So when there are norms, messages around disbelief of children, for example, um, or whatever it is that the traffickers are saying, can we get there with preventative messaging, inoculation messaging, um, other ways um, to use that, that same technology to scale prevention messaging. So more of a question. Uh, and if anyone is doing anything around that, we're really interested uh, to learn. And then the third is uh, we would welcome in many of these multilateral setting, um, speak having uh, ministries of health, public health, uh, the public health sector at the table because there is so much um, uh, from a prevention perspective where trafficking intersects with a wide range of public health issues from violence prevention um, uh, to other forms of uh, other health impacts. Uh, and so, uh, please consider within your respective areas having your ministries of health and public health at the table. Thank you. I thank you all, actually. Uh, we came to the end of our uh, session, but uh, I was planning to make a small wrap up, but I just I will take one minute of yours because uh, this this panel was so important, so different that actually representing different geographies. Uh, Will came from Australia, <laughs> Catherine came from the States, uh, Nick was from the UK, Scotland, and uh, Sandra came from Germany. So a global representation over here and the lived experience and also the, 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 the state level uh, uh, strategies and uh, uh, different uh, processes ongoing. So it was very important. I believe that uh, you have many questions mm -hmm. and you wanted uh, to take floor as well, but our speakers will be out during the lunch time. You will have the opportunity to approach and uh, to, to, some, uh, to have some discussion with them. Uh, so I am ending at this moment and giving the floor to Dear Kadi, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for moderating uh, this important discussion and a huge thanks to all of our panelists for their very insightful perspectives. Um, we are now breaking for lunch, which will be in the room where we've had the coffee breaks and the reception yesterday. Um, huge thanks also to the U.S. Uh, delegation for co-sponsoring the lunch. Uh, we will very soon be moving into the side events. We have five of them, as I mentioned yesterday, um, starting at either one o'clock or two o'clock. Um, so you may want to get your food. The food will only be offered in this room. Um, eat quickly uh, and then uh, assess which side event you may want to attend because those will be some great conversations as well. And with that, uh, bon appetit. Thank you.
If you would please take your seat if you had not yet done so. We are ready to begin our third and final panel, which is the part where we talk about what to do next and put how do we put into action uh, all of the great ideas we've heard throughout the conference so far. So the panel three is called Beyond Awareness Raising, Reshaping Prevention for the Future. And I will now turn it over to our moderator, Niall Tanis, the head of the Independent National Repertoire Mechanism on Trafficking in Human Beings for Germany. Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, panelists and colleagues, Dr. Kari, Kari Johnston. Welcome to the last panel. Allow me to say only um, a few words about my work because there's indeed a direct link between our mandate and the aim of this conference. To make prevention of human trafficking meaningful and impactful, the states need data and analyzes. We heard it from a lot of speakers the last two days. A national anti-trafficking repertoire or equivalent mechanism is exactly the tool to help states to produce, analyze, utilize, and report on data needed to improve anti-trafficking efforts. By way, for example, at the beginning of this year, we conducted, I mean, my office and me, uh, an extensive data survey on various topics, including prevention in Germany. Today's aim is to use this data to recommend evidence-based measures for politicians, decision makers, and civil society, and we hope to present our first report at the end of the year. Before we start, let me give uh, some technical information, but you know them. The panel discussion will take two hours, and we have four very interesting panelists who will all give approximately a 10-minute presentation. After the presentation, we have time for your questions and remarks, but please remember, unfortunately, we have only two minutes time. Having spent the past one and a half days dealing with various issues, relating to the causes, the need for an overall strategic approach, Above all, vulnerable groups, solutions to close gaps in the collection of quantitative and qualitative data to foster prevention strategies and measures. We will try to learn on this panel from measures that have already been successful. The panel aims to present solutions from different perspectives, such as international, national, legislat legislator, survivor, and media perspective. Speakers will propose targeted actions to effect effectively prevent human trafficking. They are structural in nature, such as government aid efforts, but also science-based in the form of data-driven, evidence-based measures, or impactful journalism, as well as comprehensive policy and law development at the perspective of those affected. And now um, it's a pleasure for me to welcome the first speaker. It is Mr. Marat Bashimov. He's a member of the Majlis of the Parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan, member of the Committee on Legislation and Judicial Reform, Doctor of Law and Professor. Throughout his professional career, Mr. Bashimov occupied various positions in the state bodies of the Republic of Kazakhstan, including serving in the Ministry of Education and Science, Secretariats of the Parliamentary Committees and the Administration of the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan. In his presentation, he will discuss the need, of, the need for prevention of THB, to be reflected in the national legislation, namely a comp comprehensive CTHB law and the experience of Kazakhstan in this regard. Mr. Bashimov, I'm pleased to give you the floor. Uh, Хотелось бы сразу выразить благодарность организаторам, уважаемый Кэрри Джонстон, ОБСЕ, за столь важную конференцию, в которой за вот эти дни узнаешь очень многое и пытаешься все вот эти вещи внести в нужный закон. 
Тут бы хотелось еще отметить о том, что сегодня обсуждались, обсуждаются разные стратегии. Но как юрист, как отмечено было, как профессор права, мне бы хотелось отметить о важности законов. Потому что законы только обеспечивают верховенство права, и в нем именно обеспечивается сама последовательность и основательность всех вот этих процессов. Хотелось бы отметить о том, что на самом деле, вот несмотря на различные усилия в сфере противодействия торговой людьми, ну это уже очень известно, по данным глобального отчета ООН по торговой людьми, каждый год миллионы людей становятся ее жертвами. Поэтому противодействие торговой людьми требовало комплексного подхода и обусловило казахстанских депутатов принять именно комплексный закон. Да, этот э, был принят в Уголовном кодексе, у нас была своя ответственность, но дело в том, что, повторюсь, комплексного, всеохватывающего, с учетом всех принципов, обязательств ОБСЕ, Международной организации миграции, Палермских протоколов, мы к этому пришли только, к сожалению, на сегодняшний день. Статьи в Уголовном кодексе, криминализирующие торговые людьми, имеют, конечно, свои ограничения. Они не могут должным образом решить вопросы всестороннего предупреждения торговой людьми, преследования за совершение этого преступления, защиты всех категорий пострадавших, а также взаимодействия субъектов на государственном, местном и международном уровнях. Я уже отметил, что такого закона в Казахстане не было, поэтому его разработка обусловлена именно приведением с учетом законодательства международного права. Хотелось бы еще важно отметить о том, что на принятие этого закона акцентировал внимание наш глава государства Касымжимар Тукаев, долгие годы проработавший одним из руководителей Организации Объединенных Наций и сделавшим приоритетом вот от этой сфере защиту прав, прав казахстанцев. Законопроектом, который уже сейчас принят в первом чтении в парламенте, предусматривается определение и организационно правовых основ государственной политики в этой сфере таких как установление уполномоченных самих органов в сфере противодействия торговым людьми, их прав и обязанностей, приведение определений в соответствии с международным правом и международными стандартами, введение новых понятий субъектов противодействия торговым людьми и их компетенции, внедрение новых механизмов, таких как оценка рисков, сбор данных в целях выявления проблем в этой сфере и порядок перенаправления жертв торговым людьми, который позволит выявлять жертв не только полиции, но и другими государственными органами. Для вот этих целей комплексного предупреждения торговой людьми четко обозначено у нас международное понятие потенциальной жертвы торговой людьми. У нас его тоже не было, было расплочено. И это не снимут тем, как которое указано в Полярском протоколе. Это все те, кто находится в уязвимом положении. Это те, кто страдают от насилия эксплуатации, материальной, психологической, иной зависимости, несовершеннолетнего или престарелого возраста, сиротства или безнадзорности, беременности, инвалидности, психического иного заболевания, злоупотребления наркотическими, алкогольными, психотропными веществами, безработицы, недокументированности, бездомности, а также неугнированного миграционного статуса. Я специально это читаю, потому что у нас этого законодательства не было. Мы привели, сделали комплексное, и сейчас правоприменителю Всем, кто занимается законом, будет это очень важно. Отдельная глава посвящена более эффективной защите прав несовершеннолетних, как наиболее, наиболее уязвимой категории и усилению профилактической работы в этой связи. Поэтому мы внесли отдельные поправки в статью нашего уголовного кодекса «Торговля людьми». И определение торговли людьми расширено именно способами воздействия на граждан в незаконной эксплуатации. Повторюсь, у нас этого не было. Среди них это угроза силы или применение другие формы принуждения, похищения, мошенничества, обмана, злоупотребления властью или уязвимостью положения, либо путем подкупа в виде платежа или выгод. Данное уточнение очень важно, поскольку дает правоохранительным органам возможность возбуждать уголовные дела во всех перечисленных случаях. К сожалению, вот это, в этой сфере у нас остается очень высокое. Понятие эксплуатации человека – приводится в соответствии с международными конвенциями в части расширения и ныне формы эксплуатации, то есть мы не ограничиваемся определенным перечнем. Также депутаты внесли поправки, их очень много на самом деле, это касается и предоставления иностранным жертвам торговой людьми 
сроков на обдумывание на период не менее 30 дней для принятия решения о сотрудничестве с правоохранительными органами. Специалисты об этом знают. Оказание содействия по возвращению в свою страну в рамках предоставления специальных социальных услуг с учетом рисков и мер предотвращения повторного попадания в ситуации торговли людьми. Тоже был непростой вопрос, потому что касалось финансов и других. Кроме того, важным является привлечение к административной ответственности тех, кто не заключает трудовые договоры с потенциальными жертвами торговли людьми, несовершеннолетними, иностранными. А это у нас наблюдается, к сожалению, сплошь и рядом и может привести к серьезным формам трудовой эксплуатации. Вот, к сожалению, вот эта проблема трудовой эксплуатации, она для нас актуальна, и принять этого закона она нам как раз очень поможет. Касательно сексуальной эксплуатации, сегодня появляются новые разновидности торговли людьми. Например, торговцы действуют через социальные сети ненавязчиво используя рекламу в своих целях. Вот у нас, спасибо, уважаемый Керри, ваши представители проводили семинары в Алматы, и она очень помогла, потому что расширила, что сейчас интернет, он становится, вот, знаете, очень таким актуальным. Для предупреждения таких преступлений выносятся такие изменения, другие нормативно правовые акты. Теперь, что важно, мы ввели уголовную ответственность за организацию сексуальных услуг через систему, через интернет. В связи с тем, что проблема торговли не является многогранной и выходит за пределы компетенции, у нас занимается это Министерство внутренних дел и Министерство социальной защиты представленных, мы обозначили в законопроекте межведомственное сотрудничество, взаимодействие, которое обязательно, тем самым комплексный подход, еще раз повторюсь, что ограничивается комплексный подход, комплексные меры у нас в законе отражены, и они как раз будут эффективно защищать права пострадавших. Одним из ключевых и важных моментов является введение нового института национального докладчика. Да, мы сегодня слушали вчера национальные докладчики, это привычное явление. Но, к сожалению, до прежнего момента у нас почему-то сопротивлялись это созданию этого института. И мы в законе прямо написали, что мы, этот институт, введение национального докладчика в лице уполномоченного по правам человека, будет, это важный шаг в правозащитной деятельности не только самого государства, но и для формирования политики в сфере предупреждения и противодействия этому преступлению на основе комплексного анализа и исследования малоизученных форм торговли людьми, о которых вы как раз говорили коллеги на предыдущих сессиях. Рассматриваемый у нас в парламенте мы жили, комплексный законопроект, заканчивая, хотелось бы отметить, что он является на самом деле актуальным и своевременным. Закон и его структура будут работать на профилактику торговли людьми и четко дают понять всем тем, что государство не будет толерантно тем, кто занимается противоправным и нарушающим права человека деянием, как торговли людьми, и будет отстаивать системно права потерпевших. Большую помощь в принятии закона оказали на самом деле международной организации, как международная организация миграции и организация по безопасности и сотрудничеству в Европе. Им большое спасибо. Полагаем, что принятие отдельного закона создаст как раз правовую базу для дальнейшего совершенствования законодательства в этой сфере с учетом международных стандартов в области прав человека, в особенности принципов Палермского протокола и обязательств ОБСЕ. Благодарю за внимание. Большое вам спасибо. Many thanks for the presentation and the very interesting developments from Kazakhstan and that you told us about uh, your new law. Now I'm pleased to welcome the second panelist, Mr. Petro Asares Rodriguez, um, joined the European, and I will uh, to introduce him. He joined the European Labour Authority in 2021 as the head of the Enforcement and Analyze Unite and is currently responsible for concert, concerted and joint inspections, tackling undeclared work and analysis and risk assessment. Before joining ELA, he worked in various positions at Europol and served a lead investigator within the Portuguese Immigration and Border Service dealing with human trafficking cases and, in particular, labor exploitation. His intervention will focus on the role of less traditional anti-trafficking actors, labor inspectors, in prevention of THB and the importance of multi-agency and cross-border collaboration to prevent and respond to THB. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your input. 
Well, thank you very much for the for the kind introduction and good afternoon to colleagues. I'll probably uh, start by thanking the OSC for the for the invitation, also for the opportunity to uh, say a few words about the European Labour Authority and what we what we do. But also let me let me say how how, how good it is to see uh, so many committed professionals to the cause of uh, countering trafficking in human beings. Um, indeed, my name is Pedro Asares. I, I work for the recently established. European Labour Authority as the head of the enforcement unit, um, and perhaps uh, I, I realize that the agency being so recent, we were just uh, put on paper, I, I wouldn't say created, but put on paper in 2019, and we became CMI operational in 2021, so I'll take the opportunity also to say a few words about the agency, just in the case that you haven't, or the likely case that you haven't uh, heard of us before. Uh, so briefly introducing the agency, our mission in a nutshell, as you can see on the slide, is to assist member states in ensuring fair labor mobility across the European Union. And, and uh, one of the ways or one of the main ways that uh, or, or via which we do that is by facilitating and enhancing cooperation uh, and facilitating concerted and joint labor inspections between uh, the national authorities of the European Union member states. Um, this is quite a unique uh, setup. So before the creation of, of the European Labour Authority, there was actually no uh, legal or institutional framework for these type of, of uh, cross-border labour inspections between uh, member states. Uh, that, that is traditionally a long-standing, uh, uh, again, uh, tradition and experience within law enforcement to do it. So cooperation between police forces dates from more than 100 years ago. Uh, but in terms of labor inspections, that was not the case until uh, very recently. So why uh, was this agency created in the first place? So the idea came uh, during a State of the Union uh, address in 2017. And I think uh, uh, the main idea behind it was that if uh, within the European Union there's freedom of movement of persons and services, it would make all sense that there is also the possibility to perform uh, checks and to ensure uh, that rules are enforced in a, in a common way and, and especially in a cross-border way. And especially if you take into account that uh, recently, uh, this comes from the intra-EU labor mobility report from 2022, there's over 10 million uh, EU citizens that live and work uh, abroad in a different member state. Around 1.7 million citizens within the European Union actually commute daily, so they cross a border on a daily basis to go to work and we have 3.6 million EU workers uh, who are posted again to work in a different EU country. And then you have a figure which I find very interesting, which says that 81% of movers uh, are active in the labor market. And from this, we gather, I think, an important conclusion that with, it, or with the exception of uh, retired people, children, spouses of, of people that move to work, uh, everyone, uh, the majority of people that actually moves to another member state does it for professional reasons. Uh, and, and if people and businesses are so mobile and actually know no borders within within the European Union, so should enforcement and labor inspections also know no borders. So there should be an easy mechanism, and now there is one, to actually perform labor inspections across, across borders as well. And then I would just call attention to a very important finding from the latest Eurostat uh, report. Uh, and... and uh, you can see that from the very, or actually the very first, uh, uh, for the very first time, labor exploitation within the European Union actually reached its highest prevalence with 41.1% of all cases concerning labor exploitation. And this is actually a very uh, 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 first occasion where we have 41.4% uh, of, of, of cases related to sexual exploitation. So we are almost on par. And I do remember uh, back in 2015, at least, uh, and, and just a little bit of background, it was already mentioned, but I, I, I'm a police officer, not a labor inspector. And back in 2015, so roughly 10 years ago, I was working for, for Europol, also within, within uh, the human trafficking uh, team. And I remember that the percentage of cases of labor exploitation was, was like 5%. So, so I'm not sure if, if the growth in the percentage actually reflects a growth in the number of cases or just tightened attention to this phenomena, but clearly now there, there are many more cases of labor exploitation which are now being identified. Um, so, um, again, entering a little bit more into the, the topic of today's conference and, and, and of this panel, I do think that labor inspectors do have a very important role to play in, in addressing, but definitely in preventing uh, cases of trafficking for labor exploitation. And labor inspections, if you think of it, do present a very 
privileged uh, occasion to detect situations of potential labor exploitation and actually to disrupt uh, uh, the business model of traffickers, which mainly consists of reducing costs to increase their profit. Uh, and, and again, colleagues, I, I don't think we can make any mistakes on this. In regards to labor exploitation, the easiest way to increase uh, profits is actually by violating workers' rights and underpaying them. Because if, if I have a company, I have very little margin of maneuver to negotiate on, on the other means of, of production. So I cannot go to the gas station and negotiate the price of fuel with, with, uh, with the petrol uh, company, or I cannot negotiate the price of electricity or water or whatever, but I can indeed negotiate the price of labor. So the labor costs are, are a very important uh, 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 production uh, input, and, and this is an easy way that traffickers actually uh, uh, reduce costs and increase their profits. So back to inspections, if you think of it again, and, and looking back also on my, on my experience as a law enforcement uh, officer, labor inspections or the work of labor inspectors actually offers many interesting possibilities, namely the possibility for a softer in enforcement approach. Because labor inspectors are typically seen by, by workers and the more vulnerable the workers are, and here we can be speaking, for example, of, of irregular migrants, uh, the more vulnerable the workers are, the more suspicious sometimes they are of, of police interventions. And that's not necessarily the case with labor inspectors. They're, they're, their focus is, is, is quite different. Um, and, and these inspections, they do offer a very informal uh, uh, setting during which labor inspectors can interact and interview workers to obtain very interesting information, for example, on the deduction of, of random fees uh, that are a primary way of creating that bondage in relation to human trafficking victims. Uh, and, and these can, for example, relate to travel, accommodation, local transportation, communications, uh, finding or, or buying food from a local uh, grocery shop, uh, personal items, and, and so on. Labor inspectors can actually also access many relevant documents with little formality. So they can access uh, written work contracts or even uh, ask questions about verbal uh, work contracts. Uh, they can access uh, records of, of work time. And this is done uh, in, a, in a very simple way during labor inspections without, uh, again, the need for, for much uh, um, um, legal uh, uh, mechanisms for it. Whereas, for example, police will need, for example, a search warrant sometimes to access some of this of this information. Labor inspectors within the scope of their functions can also access workplaces. They can check uh, uh, the conditions of, of the accommodation which is offered uh, to, 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 to workers. And they can also check violations of health and safety uh, regulations, which are often uh, an indicator of human trafficking as well. Um, in addition, social or, or labor inspections also offer uh, the possibility to check for other types of fraud, so show social dumping, uh, social fraud as well, as often uh, uh, wages are, are not paid according to rules, the working hours are excessive, uh, there's often also the lack of, of payments to tax authorities and social security payments, all of which can, can actually lead in the direction of identifying a potential case of, of uh, exploitation. There's also an interesting element uh, where perhaps there's a need to, to um, improve uh, the, the, the work of, of labor inspections, but they can actually also ask uh, workers for their residence permits or for their visas. Um, and, and this again offers a possibility to detect vulnerability. And all of this, I think, does contribute to prevention, to better prevention. Uh, and within the scope of prevention, also thinking of it, um, um, whereas law enforcement typically has a more reactive role, meaning they depend often on a complaint to act, labor inspectors within the scope of their normal uh, work every day, whenever they step foot on the ground, they are confronted with situations which could potentially be a case of, of human trafficking. So proper training, uh, a proper awareness of, of, of this reality can, can indeed, I think, contribute to better prevention and to uh, um, increased identification of, of this type of case. This is a diagram I, I find very interesting. It's taken from one of um, our reports uh, on the intersection between undeclared work and trafficking in human beings for labor exploitation. Uh, and on this slide, what I wanted to really highlight is, is how blurry the border between simpler violations of labor law and more serious uh, uh, forms of, of exploitation uh, uh, takes place. And, and this, as I see it, should uh, trigger uh, more coordinated and more cooperation between authorities and authorities with different competences that, but that converge to, to again, to 
uh, improve the detection, identification of victims, and the prevention of human trafficking. And some examples of these authorities, you can find it on the slide as well, uh, but definitely labor inspections, uh, uh, police authorities, immigration services, the judicial sector, uh, tax and social authorities also possess a wealth of information that can also contribute to the identification of cases. And then we have obviously NGOs, trade unions, uh, employers associations, and also civil society in the private sector. And why basically do we need this type of cooperation? And I think here I'm not saying any any big novelty, but I think it's always interesting to, to realize and to think how complex uh, labor exploitation and, and human trafficking is as a phenomenon. Uh, and it does require a lot of access to information and exchange of information between different authorities, which we all know is not always easy or it's easier said than done. And this brings me also to the need for a more multidisciplinary approach and the involvement of uh, different competencies and different uh, authorities as we need, uh, definitely, I would say, to, to get better at detecting, but also at prosecuting cases of, of labor exploitation in order to better protect uh, victims. And I think here there's no shortage of, of, of challenges as well. I think some have been mentioned uh, already today, uh, uh, but there is still a lack of structured cooperation between some of these authorities. Uh, so a lot of it is, a lot of it is still based on, on personal contacts and, and, and on informality, which is good. And I think uh, it, it works, but I think formalizing this, this, these relationships between uh, different authorities and describing exactly what should be the role of, of each of these authorities does help. I think also a bit, uh, big problem with, with this type of, of, of situation is that we still have a lack of common legal definitions. So we not always speak the same, the same language. Uh, cases of human trafficking, there's a high evidentiary requirement in order to, to, to reach a successful conviction in court. I think that's also a, a big limitation. And I think there's a generalized lack of, of resources. And on top of it, uh, all these authorities have different objectives and different KPIs that they need to meet. So sometimes can, uh, converging towards one single objective, in this case, preventing human trafficking and, and countering it can become uh, challenging. Um, so again, this is the same, the same uh, um, uh, diagram, but I think if we speak about cooperation, I think the area inside the, the red circle, that's where we need even better uh, coordination and cooperation between different authorities. Um, and, and I see this this special important. Again, I, 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 I'm, I, I would say fortunate to have experienced uh, work uh, in, this, in this area, both from a police uh, perspective and now from the labor inspectors uh, side as well. And I think there are different scenarios where the work of these two authorities does intersect quite significantly. Uh, and I can think, for example, of these two on the slide, whereas, for example, uh, as I've mentioned before, labor inspectors, whenever they go on a simple inspection within the scope of their daily activities, and they are, for example, faced with a potential case of, of labor exploitation, uh, there are two prerequisites for them to be effective, is that they need to be able to identify the case, to detect it, and then they need to be able to refer it for investigation. And this requires indeed knowing your own mandate, but also knowing the mandate of others and, and having the, the proper skill set to identify cases, so knowing indicators. Uh, so there's a big element of capacity building and training also uh, um, involved, but also there's an element of knowing your partners and having the contact details of the authority that you need to refer the case to. Uh, on the other side, the same the same holds true. So uh, law enforcement authorities, whenever they are investigating a case of human trafficking for labor exploitation, often it's challenging to produce enough evidence for a successful uh, conviction. So even in the case where uh, during prosecution, um, the investigation is not successful in convicting human traffickers and exploiters, I think there's still uh, a lot of information useful in the, in the case file for, for, for this investigation that police officers can still revert to labor inspectors and labor inspectors can still do a lot with it. And, and again, this is this goes in the direction of prevention. They can impose a number of administrative uh, penalties uh, to companies and to employers. And I think there's a very deterrent uh, effect to this. To this. And, and it's a second use to the information and to the evidence which was collected within the scope of the, of the primary investigation. Um, on this slide, uh, still within the scope of, of prevention efforts and, and multidisciplinary approaches. Uh, here you'll find two examples of cross-border labor uh, inspections, uh, which are done in cooperation uh, between the European Labor Authority and, and Europol. 
with a big focus on, on trafficking in human beings for labor exploitation. Uh, and on the left side, you'll see the press release for 2022. And here we try to bring together labor inspectors and police officers and, and a number of different authorities as well. So tax authorities also, also play a role, for example. And they basically uh, um, define targets and they launch joint uh, uh, um, inspections and joint police operations to detect uh, uh, potential cases of trafficking and victims. And I, I think it's too small to read on the slide, but for example, in 2022, actually 874 workers uh, have been, have been uh, uh, identified as being uh, victims of labor exploitation or victims of violations of their labor rights during one week alone. So these are uh, interesting uh, um, um, initiatives. In 2023, there were also a number of, of different uh, uh, results, so a, a number of arrests, an equal number of victims identified. And I think once we compile all these results and we make it visible across, across the European Union, I think it sends a signal that also member states are, are, are committed to fighting this type of phenomena in a, in a, a, a joint way. And I think this also has a, a preventative and, and deterrent uh, uh, effect to it. Uh, and, and mindful of the time, I don't want to overstretch it, but this is it from, from my side. Thank you very much. Many thanks um, for the interesting insights into the work and the role of the labor inspections and, of course, of their challenges. Um, thank you. Now, uh, I, I would like to welcome our third speaker. Uh, it is Mrs. Mariam Bhatti. She's a qualified community development and social policy practitioner with extensive experience of advocacy and community organizing in Ireland and Europe. Mariam is one of the 10 women co-founders of the Great Care Co-op, 2019 UN Fellow and recognized among the 100 most influential people of African descent under 40 worldwide in 2020. She's the member of the European Commission's expert group on migra migration and the OSCE's survivor-led advisory council. Um, the focus of her intervention will be the importance of learning from Serbia's to reshape prevention of THB and innovative survivor-led initiatives to prevent trafficking and re-trafficking. And she will give us some very important recommendations. Um, the, thank you, Mariam. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear all hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, it brings great memories uh, to have had engagements with the OSCE. Um, when I look back at um, 2011, as far back as 2011, when 23 of us in Ireland who had experienced um, forced labor um, were working on a campaign to get Ireland to criminalize forced labor. And we had a visit from the OSCE at the time. I didn't know what it was. Um, but if you can imagine, you know, such a group of people that have just emerged from this uh, trauma and uh, without so much support as well. It's one of the things that I will talk about, remind you of, you know, in terms of access to health, including mental health. Um, but um, we were working very odd jobs. And then in the evenings, we would uh, organize each other and, you know, we blind this campaign. So it brings really great memories to be still connected to the OSCE in this manner. Um, the reason I'm mentioning this, there's nothing, um, is that there's nothing as important as being treated as if you matter. Uh, a lot of us can agree with that. Um, just beginning with a quote from Maya Angelou that said, people will forget what you said. People might forget what you did, um, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So the OEC made us feel as if we met out at that point. Thank you. Um, on behalf of uh, the International Survivors of Trafficking uh, Advisory Council, um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about uh, some of the recommendations I have. So when I arrived in Ireland, uh, maybe quickly before to say what Pedro has been talking about makes a lot of sense because we worked a lot with labor inspectors in Ireland um, among many other campaigns that we're su successful on. Um, but uh, maybe that's a topic for another time. Um, when I arrived in Ireland, 
um, uh, over a decade ago, I found myself in, in uh, forced labor very quickly. I had uh, come from Johannesburg, arrived with a ver uh, 6 a.m. very early flight, 6 a.m. in the morning. I always remind people that I remember pulling my cabin size olive green suitcase, um, uncertain of what the future had in store for me, but full of um, hope and possibilities uh, of possibilities that lay ahead of me. And of course, that moment, you know, um, would quickly turn into um, what I didn't understand was exploitation at the time, uh, long days of working, 14 to 16 hours of working six days a week, uh, working as a, a housekeeper and childminder for medical professionals who knew very well what it, what it means physically to overwork someone like that and mentally. Um, but having passport checked and then being forced to be undocumented, you know, by not having the promise to work permit uh, processed, you know, which led to further victimization and threats of being reported to the officials. If um, you know, uh, um, I, you know, I didn't. If I when I said I wanted to leave and, and move on because I felt that maybe it was better to return home. I couldn't, I was stopped from that by my employer at the time. So I've had many moments to reflect from that moment to the moment I met another migrant woman that brought me to uh, a migrant organization at the time, uh, the Domestic Workers Action Group, which was the only campaigning group in Ireland to you know, bring to the fore issues affecting migrant domestic workers. I just want to uh, highlight these unresolved issues that I see and highlight that um, throughout my reflection, you know, doing um, parliamentary presentations on the need for the criminalization of forced labor, um, having worked with ISTAC, um, the International Survivors Advisory Council, having been part of policy advisory of the policy advisory uh, group uh, with the European Commission, and continuing to engage, having worked also in direct support, uh, uh, supporting others that have experience, had experienced forced labor. Um, I want to remind you of these key things that still remain that I have noticed um, that to this day, a lot of people still don't have access to health, uh, including mental health, um, to be able to rebuild their lives. Uh, a lot of people are left behind when it comes to accessing decent employment. Um, Research also shows that among certain groups, uh, you know, some minorities, not only ethnic minorities, a number of minorities, people with the, uh, lower educational outcomes, but also migrants, they tend to be in low paid work. Uh, this does not allow people to progress fully. Um, um, also, for example, the group that I belong to, uh, something I'm very passionate about in terms of access to decent employment, because this is the only thing that allows us to be able to move on forward meaningfully. A lot of us uh, do not come from backgrounds where we are princesses or, or you know, with huge inheritances, we are heirs of huge amounts of money. We rely on employment, accessing employment to be able to, to, you know, to progress in life. But without the relevant education, it's really hard to access. Also, for some, we know that with the right kind of education, if you are the wrong ethnicity, um, it's it's difficult to access. In Ireland, and the, the Fundamental Rights Agency has shown as well that across Europe, um, people of African descent and African migrants in, in, in particular have the lowest access to the labor market, lowest access rates. At, uh, for example, the Irish census, uh, the re most recent one showed that we had only 43% of access to the labor market, regardless of the level of education and experience that we have. If your states, you do not have initiatives that look at groups like ourselves and many others that are left behind. You know, you are worried about the wider population saying, oh, why, why are they getting special uh, treatment? There is no special treatment when we talk about positive measures. You cannot sit there and be happy that certain groups, because by virtue of being who they are, something they have no control over. I didn't choose to, to look like this or be born where I was born. You didn't choose either. So by pure lot of where we're born, we shouldn't be disadvantaged by that. And I, I invite states to be active participants, active initiators of uh, positive measures. Uh, going to some of the last points on the reminders, um, for some groups that may have experienced, let's say, trafficking, but they also belong to some of the groups that I mentioned. Um, the intersection is so deep um, and the, the trench they are in is so deep that without an, an, an intervention, it's going to be very hard to climb out of. So we need those interventions. And then going forward to the suggestions, um, I think it's really important for us to 
look at what has worked well in other regions to see if these can work well for us where we are uh, in our countries, in our regions. For example, I heard Canada talk about the hotline. Uh, I'm sure other countries have those. Maybe they may not have shared. I've heard of um, also when I was uh, doing the UN Fellowship for People for African Descent, I got to know about um, a certain region of Canada. I don't remember now what it is, but it's the French-speaking region. And they talked about the fund. They had said the government, the federal government had introduced this fund to look at minorities and accessing uh, funding for entrepreneurship. And I thought that was amazing. It's one of the of the initiatives I follow very closely. Um, one of the things we have done uh, ourselves in Ireland, because I'm a co-founder of the Great Care Co-op, which is a home care provider, the first of its kind in Ireland. Uh, it was set up by 10 of us. And among us, I know that people that set this up, they'd come from previously a campaigning group. And within that campaigning group, half of the people were survivors of uh, human trafficking in domestic servitude. K is what we knew best, and we felt that if we developed an organization that would be an example of what great employment should look like and providing a great service and in this nonprofit, that would be amazing. So it's something that we have done. I would like to see other examples like those. While it's not actively working on preventing trafficking, it's definitely contributing towards uh, preventing re-trafficking because we found that a number of women that were working in this sector uh, continued to go into bad jobs because there was no any other option because of some of the reasons I mentioned earlier. That's one of the examples. And I also would like to uh, look at another recommendation, which is the integration of policies. I think when you look at, for example, labor, migration policies, um, employment policies, and trafficking policies, it's really important that they work closely together um, you know, in a way that can best support um, people that are exiting trafficking uh, or victims. Um, also, information should not be difficult to access for those that are maybe will be migrants. Uh, I know I'm focusing so much on migrants. I know that other countries trafficking is within the countries. Uh, it's not a, a, an area I have a, a, you know expertise on, but I have that at, at the back of my mind that whether you're living in a small town, um, you know whether people are living in their small towns um, or they are crossing borders, it's really important. I'm uh, thinking of crossing borders. It's really important that information is accessible. I arrived, for example, in Ireland with very little information about my rights as a worker. Um, also, I, I thought that because I didn't have a work permit ready at the time my employer said she will process it on an arrival, it meant that I had lesser rights. But as a human being, you know, why should my work be less than that of a person who's holding a work permit? You know, why should I be exploited because of that? Um, and then that pathways for migration, policies that are really um, I don't know how I can, I can describe them, but policies that are, are really ruthless towards uh, migrants, as you may see migrants as a threat. Migrants, as far as I know, many migrants I've known, they've left countries, they are going to to work, to look for better opportunities. I don't know any migrant who is going to another country to say, you know what, I'm gonna go sit and put my feet up and get free benefits or whatever. Most people I know are working two or three jobs, including myself. I'm one of those people that it's very rare that I have time off. So when I'm here at events like this, it's, it's the only time off. So many migrants, I know that they are out there to work. So policies should really allow us to be able to do this. Um, that would prevent trafficking as well, because you make it easy for traffickers, if you're going to make policies, that's difficult. Okay, towards uh, my last point, um, one of the points that has continuously been made here was about um, technology, how much technology has enabled people to be able to traffic others, to exploit others. Why are we not taking advantage of technology for people to be able to access employment globally wherever they are? without having to leave the borders because a lot of the people leave home simply because they want to access better employment. If we can do that, we don't hold employment in our own corners and say, oh, only the right to work in such, such a place. Why are we not opening you know, employment without borders? People should access employment where they are, um, make it difficult um, for traffickers to continue doing what they are doing. You've mentioned collaboration. I've heard collaboration a number of times mentioned that it's really, really important to work in a collaborative approach. One of the last points I want to mention is unpaid wages for people. Um, 
for example, people that have, may have taken their, have been supported, take their cases through the labor courts and the like. And you still find that, yeah, in some cases, I think my colleague uh, Malaika or earlier mentioned that what, what use is it to me to have the trafficker behind bars when I didn't get you know, when I'm still in, in, in a precarious situation, I'm still homeless. I, I'm still not paid the wages I'm owed. I think there needs to be enforcement of this. When I was campaigning with the Migrant Rights Center, I think at the time in 2008, they they were awarded, I think, close to 2 million uh, in unpaid wages on forced labor. Only about uh, 200,000 of that was paid. Why are states then saying, okay, take years, go through this trauma, see your employer in the labor court, at the labor court, and uh, they almost, you know, they're aggressive to you even at the labor court. I remember my employer was. Um, go through all of that and get a letter, beautiful letter that says, you, we believe you, you didn't have a, a proper call, like a written contract, yet a verbal contract, but based on the story you've told us, we believe you. And I was so happy. I still have that letter framed, but I never saw the payment to this day. It's, it's you know, over, what, 10 years later. So it's really important that we address this. I think I have said enough and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam, for talking about your experience. And I'm very proud uh, to learn from you, from your um, experience and also from your work. Now we come to the last pre presentation um, on this panel. I'm pleased to welcome Leif Kohlem. Um, he's a journalist and the executive editor of the CNN Freedom Project. He has produced more than 50 award-winning documentaries and more than 10 years broadcasting the CNN Freedom Project. It has helped free over 2,000 people, raised $25 million for anti-trafficking organizations, catalyzed public relays and inspired grassroots actions, facilitated life-saving Surgeries for tortured victims of trafficking and spurred changes in federal laws and business practices from Cambodia to California. He will inform us about the role of media in prevention of THB, ethical storytelling and much more. Impact that media can bring the boost anti-trafficking prevention and response at national and international levels. So it's your, the floor is open. Thank you, Naila. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I've traveled a long way to get here and have the opportunity to share my thoughts with all of you. But I don't want to begin without first expressing my deep appreciation to Dr. Johnston and the entire OSCE team for arranging this fantastic Alliance Conference and allowing me to be a part of it. I live in Los Angeles, right in the heart of the film industry. In my spare time, I dabble in screenwriting, as is almost a requirement there. And I've come to learn new movies often focus on the same themes of previous films that have been successful. When one film makes movies, or one, one film makes money, you can expect a parade of similarly themed movies to soon follow suit. In recent years, you may have noticed several films taking on the theme of human trafficking. When I was on the plane coming over here, I read about a new film called Maya, and a girl lured into sex, a child sex trafficking scheme. Last summer, many of you may have seen The Sound of Freedom, a, a highly dramatized story about Tim Ballard's career spent rescuing victims of trafficking. I don't think I need to tell anyone in this room about the problems with that film, but it's important to note that The Sound of Freedom made nearly a quarter billion dollars at the box office. And if not for journalists who had pointed out some of the fallacies both on screen and behind the scenes, most people might have left the theater thinking that one man on a mission is the best, if not the only way, to dismantle one of the world's fastest growing crimes. Unfortunately, as we all know, in real life, the issue of trafficking in human beings is far more complicated. Last week, I interviewed Grace Forrest, the founding director of Walk Free. Ms. Forrest po pointed out the Global Slavery Index shockingly found that in the last five years, there's been a 10 million person increase of the number of people living in modern slavery globally. So what is behind this disheartening trend? The truth of the matter is, as several distinguished panelists have pointed out, people are simply becoming more vulnerable. 
Some government institutions are failing in their duty to protect the people living within their own borders. The media too is consumed with its own challenges, facing numerous shifts in our industry, not the least of them being the financial hardships brought on in part by the speed, ubiquity, and inaccuracies inherent in social media. I did a story last month with the US Department of Labor about children doing dangerous work in chicken processing factories outside Los Angeles. And they said, frankly, they are overwhelmed with cases in nearly every state in the US. As one of the investigators told me, they are addressing the waves that come to shore, but they know there is still an ocean of victims still behind them. The media industry too is caught in the rising tide. With shrinking budgets and shortened deadlines, it's becoming increasingly difficult for news outlets to justify the costs of an investigation. It is far easier in the climate of now to react to news rather than proactively search out a story with no certainty of an outcome. That to me is what makes CNN's commitment to the cause we've all gathered here for so remarkable and such an outlier in the industry. It also, I hope, offers a beacon for the future as we explore ways to go beyond awareness raising and look at new ways of attacking trafficking of human beings before the crime occurs. We know the media plays a critical role in exposing human injustices. And since 2011, the CNN Freedom Project has used its global platform to tell stories that pierce through social veils and entrenched political and economic interests. The examples are too numerous to count. We've challenged the electronics and green vehicle industries by going deep into the Congo to report on cobalt mining practices. We've exposed the exploitation inherent in the business model of big chocolate. And followed that up by traveling with the COO of Nestle from Switzerland to the Ivory Coast. And just last month, we went into the Amazon where we met a 13 year old boy who instead of going to school, wakes up at three o'clock every morning, takes a boat into the jungle where he spends the day climbing 25 meter tall trees without any safety equipment, all to harvest acai berries, the latest high priced superfood that goes into the so-called power bowls or smoothies in the developed world. These are all children doing the work of adults so that we may enjoy simple luxuries most of us simply take for granted. I would challenge many of you who are much smarter and better placed than I to search out solutions to some of these economic problems. And I, I would also challenge you to find another global entity besides CNN willing to go to these lengths and traverse these obstacles to simply tell the real life stories of people who are at the bottom of the supply chain. The project now in its 13th year has told more than 1100 such stories of trafficking in human beings. And from those, we know more than 2000 people who have been rescued by authorities shortly thereafter. We saw hundreds of people released after a documentary uncovering the kidnapping and ransom schemes of Bedouin tribes, taking advantage of Somali, Eritrean and Sudanese migrants, extorting money from their relatives or else harvesting their victims and leaving their bodies to die in the desert. Until that story aired, reports of organ trafficking had often been largely rumor or hearsay. Since then, we've seen hundreds more people rescued from brick cones and brothels or intercepted in transit from Nepal or the Philippines on their way to dubious or fictitious jobs in the Middle East. All of them a direct result of our investigations. And there are also the knock on effect stories of the impact our reporting has had in other people's lives. Some of you may be familiar with Francesca Awa, who was a US State Department trafficking in persons hero and founder of the Survivor Network. Francesca is from Cameroon and was being held in domestic servitude in Kuwait. She had been lured there thinking she would be an English tutor, but instead was assaulted and forced to work at all hours for no pay. She was in the kitchen working when a CNN Freedom Project story happened to come on the TV and inspired, Francesca decided to make a run for it. She found an embassy and called the person we'd featured in that story, Katie Ford, who helped arrange her freedom and return her to Cameroon, where she has created a new life as an advocate and abolitionist, warning others not to fall in the same trap she had. There is also the story that came from My Freedom Day last year. My Freedom Day is a day CNN created focused on action and centered around schools. It's designed to educate and activate young people on the topic of human trafficking. One girl in Bolivia took what she learned that day in 2022 to school authorities, reporting suspicious signs involving a classmate. 
It turned out the classmate was being trafficked for commercial sex, and a subsequent police investigation uncovered 18 other girls who were being similarly exploited. Impact journalism initiatives like the CNN Freedom Project play a crucial role in addressing THP by shining a light on this pervasive human rights issue. Through in-depth investigations and compelling storytelling, initiatives like ours not only expose the harsh realities of THB, but also empower audiences to take meaningful action in preventing and responding to human trafficking. However, with this responsibility come significant challenges for the media. Reporters face obstacles such as accessing sensitive locations, protecting vulnerable sources, and navigating legal complexities. Moreover, Ethical considerations demand careful reporting to avoid re-traumatizing survivors or compromising ongoing investigations. Despite these challenges, the media's commitment to uncovering and reporting on THB remains vital for preventing the crime, holding perpetrators accountable, and driving systemic change. All of this is to say, to the extent that the media can collaborate with other stakeholders involved in the fight against trafficking, while still maintaining editorial sovereignty, we should do so. It is important to state that we as journalists often may rely on government institutions and NGO partners for the stories and the access required to tell them. It is in some ways a trust exercise. At CNN, we don't agree to any storylines ahead of time and no one we're working with gets to see the story before it airs. I can imagine from where you're sitting, that might be a little unnerving, uh, but the uh, rewards can be outstanding, I assure you. We had a viewer in the UK donate $1 million to an organization after being inspired by a story we did in 2020. And you may remember that story about Nestle. Not to be outdone by the coverage, shortly thereafter, Hershey's pledged $10 million to provide education in the areas of West Africa where their cocoa is harvested. It's important to note as journalists, we decided early on not to name and shame companies or governments that find THB taking place. Rather, we've celebrated their bravery for coming forward and proactively working to resolve the problem. I think that sets a good example, and it's important to all of those we work with that the aim of impact journalism is to find and tell stories that spark action and empower communities to address and solve pressing challenges for a better world. What we've developed with the Freedom Project is a way to seamlessly integrate our stories with the regular news gathering apparatus, abiding by the same editorial standards and principles that makes CNN a global leader in news, while at the same time adding an extra overlay of commitment to human rights and the cause of the stories we're telling. So in conclusion, I'll end by paraphrasing a CNN slogan from the Trump era, which I think rightly applies to the theme of this discussion. The world needs journalists. So too do abolitionists. I encourage everyone here to think about ways they can involve storytellers in their work. And please, if you ever have any stories, my door and my inbox are always open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee, for your very interesting perspective and the elaborations on the opportunities provided by media. And I want to repeat it again, how to boost anti-trafficking prevention. Um, now we, oh, we can open the floor for the remarks and questions. And um, we have uh, given the number of the delegations and organizations uh, who have signed up to take the floor to the panel discussion. Um, um, I have to please, I have to remember, please, to uh, limit your floor interventions for two minutes. I'm sorry, but uh, we have to close this um, panel at uh, uh, in ti on time at um, 5 p.m. So I uh, on my list first on my list I have a representative mm -hmm. from Belgium on behalf of the UA and uh, to be followed by the United States and Switzerland. Please. Merci, Madame la modératrice. Euh, je passerai la avec votre autorisation, je passerai la parole à la délégation de l'Union européenne. Dee would like to thank the panelists for their insightful contributions, uh, which have enriched the conversation and provided the participants with a comprehensive overview of co 
harvesting practices. We have noted with great interest the innovative ideas and tools that were discussed during the session and the potential to drive impactful change. Empowering vulnerable groups, fostering cooperation to tackle emerging forms of exploitation and building resilience must remain key principles for effective prevention efforts. The EU therefore underlines the importance of applying a human rights-based, victim-centered, gender-responsive and age-specific approach to combating trafficking in human beings. Additionally, exploring possible synergies with the private sector should be encouraged to address not only labor exploitation, but also other forms of trafficking. The EU has cooperated closely with the EU Labor Authority in that regard. The banking and financial sectors are stakeholders that could be valuable partners, especially concerning the detection of exploitation. Finally, cooperation with the private sector can also be valuable to harness innovation and expertise for the development of technology-based solutions to support prevention and combating trafficking in human beings. Uh, we value the discussion held over the course of the conference. Um, they have provided an overview of the persisting gaps and challenges in the prevention of human trafficking, looked into vulnerabilities and inspired inv innovative approaches for future prevention efforts. The Alliance against trafficking in person remains a valuable platform for facilitating the coordination of the efforts of its partners. In its inclusive whole of society approach, bringing together not only participating states, but also major international organizations, civil society, media, the private sector, academia, and professional networks of national anti-trafficking practitioners is essential to address this issue in a comprehensive manner. In the context of the continuing war of aggression of Rus uh, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine and its people, we must all commit to maintain prevention measures in place to avert further exploitation of victims and to protect children who also pay the price of the war. Um, as we reflect on discussion and insights shared during this conference, it is evident that while progress has been made, the fight against trafficking in human beings remain an ongoing and complex challenge. The European Union, alongside its member states and the EU anti-trafficking coordinator, reaffirm its unwavering commitment to combating this heinous crime. As trafficking in human beings continues to grow in scope and in scale and profits generated from it are rising dangerously, a strong focus on prevention is more crucial than ever. By fostering cooperation, harnessing in innovation and prioritizing prevention efforts, we stand united in our determination to protect the most vulnerable and eradicate human trafficking in all its forms. We would like to thank once more the Office of the Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings for successfully organizing this event, as well as all the speakers and the participants for the valuable insights. Let us turn these thought-provoking discussions into actionable solutions towards a safer future for all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. Now, uh, the United States, please. We would like to thank uh, especially the panel for this innovative suggestions. And we also want to acknowledge and thank the special um, representative for the breadth and depth of ex expertise that have been provided by survivors and those with lived experience on literally every panel and every discussion that we have had during the last two days. And on that note, we wanted to make an uh, announcement that we have a notice of funding opportunity out from the Trafficking in Persons Office, which is, will go to a survivor-led organization uh, to provide training and technical assistance from our office um, that can provide assistance to organizations and countries who want to establish formal advisory councils like have been discussed today and recommended today for incorporating the expertise of survivors and lived experience more formally. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was really quick. <laughs> that was great. Um, the next uh, representative uh, comes from Switzerland. Thank you, moderator. Switzerland thanks the OEC for organizing this important conference and all panelists for their enriching contributions. As we gather for this event, trafficking continues to violate the human rights and dignity of thousands of individuals in the OEC region. 
especially the most vulnerable members of our societies. Given the rapidly evolving modi operandi of traffickers, as well as ongoing and escalating conflicts that exacerbate existing vulnerabilities, it is more important than ever to focus our collective efforts on prevention. We would like to express our full support to the Office of the Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings. We appreciate its work in preventing and responding to this serious crime, including in the context of the humanitarian crisis related to the war in Ukraine. Switzerland is strongly committed to the fight against trafficking in human beings. One of the priorities of our third national action plan against trafficking is the prevention of labor exploitation, in particular in global supply chains. Over the past year, Switzerland has supported companies with capacity building measures and specific, gui and specific guidance on how to integrate adequate human rights due diligence into their core business. Such procedures are key to preventing human rights abuses, including labor exploitation, and contribute to sustainable economies that prevent further vicious cycles of exploitation. While human trafficking generates billions of dollars in profits each year, investigating these illicit flows can disrupt exploitative business models and prevent future exploitation. Based on Switzerland's strong commitment to preventing human trafficking and preserving the integrity of its financial center, the Swiss Financial Intelligence Unit in cooperation with the Office of, and of the Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Traffic in Human Beings, recently launched the Financial Intelligence Against Human Trafficking Project in Switzerland. It aims to provide tools to identify activities potentially linked to human trafficking and strengthening cooperation between authorities, the financial sector, and other relevant actors. We thank the OECE for its valuable support and look forward to continued cooperation in the framework of this and other projects. As mentioned by various panelists, a comprehensive understanding of the multiple vulnerabilities that drive human trafficking is essential. As different forms of discrimination and inequality are interlinked, we need to think holistically and cross-dimensionally when developing prevention strategies. We also need to strengthen existing partnership and forge new ones to minimize the number of potential victims and end human suffering. I thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Um, now uh, I want to um, call up the next um, representatives and I say, uh, and you, so that you can prepare yourself. At first we have on my list, it's um, the delegation of Israel. And then uh, I will, we have uh, some organizations, Council of Europe, Interpol and Asian Act. And we start with the delegation of Israel. Thank you. Honorable Chair. I would like to congratulate Dr. Carrie Johnston, the Special Representative on the First Alliance under your directorship and thank all the team for the organization of this important and successful event. Dear colleagues and friends, I was honored to join you today focusing on prevention of trafficking in human beings due to the massive direct and aggressive attack of Iran against Israel on Saturday night. I could not be here yesterday as all flights were canceled, but I was thankful to be with you here today. We cannot, however, discuss trafficking without marking 193 days since Israel was the target of a barbaric attack by the terrorist organization Hamas on the 7th of October, during the course of which more than 1,200 people, Israelis and foreigners, were cruelly murdered subject to horrific abuse, including sexual violence, mutilation and rape. Over 130 victims are still held hostage by the Hamas in Gaza. This runs counter to all international laws, and beyond the other many war crimes enacted by Hamas, these also constitute trafficking in human beings' crimes and violations of all international obligations in this regard. There are serious concerns, as recently confirmed in the report of the Special Representative of the UN Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Areas of Conflict, who collected all the evidence and facts that the hostages 
are also held for the purpose of gender-based sexual violence, including rape, sexualized torture, and cruel, inhumane, degrading treatment by the captors against some of the hostages. And there are reasonable grounds to believe that this is ongoing. Their lives are used as a commodity to be traded as mere bargaining chips with no regard to their welfare and dignity as human beings. And we ask all member states to utterly denounce this call and act for the immediate safe release of all the hostages. Traffickers often target, as we have heard today many times, the most vulnerable persons in society, preying on their vulnerability and exploiting them for varied purposes. In situations of emergency and conflict, these vulnerabilities are exacerbated and demand a swift response and global support. Beyond the particular horrors of the October 7 attack, Israel was left to deal with new and multiple challenges in its wake. Massive internal displacement from both the border adjacent towns and cities in the south and those in the north. Around 227,000 people, as well as foreign workers in Israel who have had to deal with the fear and uncertainty of being at war in a foreign country. The anti-trafficking unit that I head worked together with government and civil society to swiftly act to protect vulnerable persons and prevent further exploitation. For example, diverting state funds for distribution of food vouchers for persons in prostitution, particularly asylum seekers and irregular migrants, enacting a special fast track for allocation from the special forfeiture fund for victims of trafficking, safety programs aimed at preventing sexual exploitation of children and youth in displacement centers and hotels, and outreach to foreign workers to ensure protection of their safety and rights. We also enacted focused research aimed at prevention and forming evidence-based policy that to show us what really works. It is part of our steadfast commitment to protect the vulnerable, standing against the cruel use of the innocent and contribute to addressing the phenomenon worldwide as human trafficking runs contrary to our values of freedom, democracy, and human dignity. Looking forward, as in the, 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 the panel was discussed, we have been focusing in recent years on other new forms and emerging trends of human trafficking, such as in the context of international surrogacy, organ trafficking, forced marriage, child labor and begging, and persons with disability. And we strive to take part and contribute to global cooperation and dialogue, sharing best practices and dealing, on dealing with these forms of modern slavery. We continue to strengthen and expand our efforts to ensure no victim is left behind. We urge you to do the same and to act today to condemn these heinous attacks of Hamas and Iran, to release the victims of these crimes against humanity and position yourselves on the right side of this equation. I thank you for, for your solidarity and invite you to join me in ending with a prayer for more peaceful and better days soon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now the next representatives, um, the next speakers are representatives from uh, the Council of Europe, Interpol and Asian Act uh, at First Council of Europe. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the OEC for the choice of the thematic focus of this year's Alliance Against Trafficking Conference, which looked into ways to reshape prevention by addressing vulnerabilities to human trafficking. Uh, this theme tallies with the focus which has been chosen by the Council of Europe Group of Experts on Action Against Human Trafficking, Greta, for the fourth evaluation round of the Council of Europe Anti-Trafficking Convention, which was launched in July last year. This new evaluation round of the Council of Europe Convention focuses on vulnerabilities to human trafficking and measures taken by the state parties to prevent detect these vulnerabilities and also to support vulnerable victims and punish the offenders. Uh, this includes a focus on the use of information and communication technology, which brings new structural cha changes to the way offenders operate and exacerbates existing vulnerabilities. Um, so we have launched, as I said, uh, in July, this evaluation round, uh, the questionnaire which is being sent to uh, state parties following the chronology of the previous evaluation rounds includes questions um, related to uh, measures taken to address vulnerabilities to trafficking of persons from disadvantaged minorities, persons with disabilities, migrant workers, asylum seekers, and so on. Uh, the questionnaire also looks at how national law and policies to discourage demand address particular vulnerabilities and groups at risk. 
the chronology, as I said, is similar to the one of previous rounds. We have already started by carrying out visits to Austria, Cyprus and the Slovak Republic, and there are plans to visit Albania and Moldova in the coming weeks. Uh, so uh, we look forward to using the uh, convention provisions as a tool for continuing to mobilize uh, our state parties' responses to human trafficking with this particular new focus of this evaluation round. And we also look forward to continuing our excellent uh, cooperation and synergies with the OEC uh, in the areas where we have been collaborating um, previously, including uh, in the areas of uh, uh, supply chain uh, and financial investigations. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Thank you. Let me again remember you uh, to the two minutes. Uh, so we have uh, the chance to hear a lot of uh, remarks. The next speaker comes from Interpol. Thank you, Mrs. Moderator. Uh, my brief intervention today is focused, as expected, on the importance of international police cooperation in combating human trafficking. In today's interconnected world, human trafficking and smuggling of migrants persist as significant challenges that present borders and threaten the fundamental rights and dignity of individuals worldwide. Vulnerable populations, including children, refugees and migrants seeking better opportunities, are disproportionately affected, falling prey to different forms of exploitation, including forced labor and sex trafficking. Tragically, many fall vic victim to deception, extortion, violence and even death. In response to these alarming trends, there is an urgent need for a coordinated and co comprehensive global effort to combat human trafficking and smuggling of migrants. Such efforts must encompass enhanced cross-border cooperation, intelligence sharing mechanism, capacity building initiatives, victim-centered approaches, and robust legal frameworks to hold perpetrators accountable and provide support and protection to survivors. One such effort is Operation Stormakers 2, the first Interpol operation specifically targeting the phenomenon of human trafficking fuel fraud, which mobilized law enforcement in 27 countries and which revealed further evidence that this crime trend is expanding beyond Southeast Asia. Following five months of investigative coordination, law enforcement from participating countries carried out more than 270,000 inspections and police checks at 450 human trafficking and migrant smuggling hotspots. Many of the hotspots are regularly used to traffic victims to notorious cyber scam centers in Southeast Asia and other regions. Victims are often lured through fake jobs ad job ads and forced to commit online fraud on an industrial scale while enduring horrific physical abuse. Fraud schemes include fake cryptocurrency investment, as well as work from home lottery romance and online gambling scams. In total, the operation resulted in the arrest of 281 individuals for offenses such as human trafficking, passport forgery, corruption, and sexual exploitation, the rescue of 149 human trafficking victims, and more than 360 investigations open, many of which remain ongoing. Prevention, the very topic of this conference, was a key focus of the operation, with member countries rolling out awareness campaign campaigns to help potential victims avoid being trafficked. Preventative checks by police officers at border checkpoints who looked for telltale signs of trafficking amongst travelers succeeded in intercepting nearly 800 potential victims across all countries. Migrant smuggling and human trafficking are increasingly connected to other crime areas such as cybercrime, financial, drugs-related crime, or environmental crime, and only our collective effort will serve as a testament to the power of international police co cooperation and the unwavering commitment of your respective authorities to uphold justice and protect the rights of individuals worldwide. By pooling resources, expertise and intelligence, we can effectively disrupt the operations of organized criminal groups engaged in human trafficking and smuggling of migrants, thereby safeguarding countless lives. In light of this, this the Human Trafficking and Smuggling of Migrants Unit at Interpol would like to take this opportunity to encourage all member countries and external partners, many here in this room today, to take part in any future future Interpol operations focused on combating human trafficking and smuggling of migrants. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, no the next uh, speakers come from the th next three organizations, Asian Act, then it's followed by Slave Shack Foundation and Hope of Justice. Please, Asia Asian Act at first. Thank you, Madam Moderator, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to make this intervention on behalf of the Australian government-funded ASEAN Australia Counter-Trafficking Program, or known as ASEAN Act. 
Our programs support ASEAN and ASEAN member states to pursue human rights-based approach to countering trafficking in person. Building on what speaker has said in relation to prevention effort for the future, uh, we would like to highlight the urgent issues of persons with disabilities and their vulnerability to trafficking. To start to build the evidence base for more effective prevention in this area, in partnership with ASEAN Sectoral Body and Australian University La Trobe, we undertook a study on the nexus of disability and trafficking in person in the ASEAN region. For the research, from the research finding, numerous forms of trafficking are experienced by persons with disability, and similarly, victims of trafficking experience mental, psychosocial, and physical impairment acquired from the experience of being trafficked. During the study, obtaining accurate disaggregated data on the numbers of victims of trafficking with disability is a significantly challenge. Two of the main obstacles to this area to this are challenge in identifying victims of trafficking with disabilities and lack of data disaggregated by disability itself. There is also a significant disconnection between stakeholders working in counter-trafficking and those working in the area of disability. We also learn that persons with disability are more vulnerable to their marginalization, socioeconomic status, and lack of access to opportunities and decent work. We, we found that prevention efforts uh, aimed at reducing vulnerability to, tra to trafficking are often not inclusive of or accessible for persons with disabilities, and as such, have limited reach and effectiveness for the future we can do better. It is our hope that this evidence base uh, provide a strong call to action for all counter trafficking stakeholders in the ASEAN region and globally to take immediate steps to reduce the vulnerability of persons with disabilities to trafficking and make responses to trafficking more inclusive and equitable. The study of a recommendation for improvement to laws, policies, and practices, which ASEAN Act will be taking forward in partnership with our regional and national partners, including Organization of Persons with Disabilities and Civil Society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now the next speaker are coming from Slave, Slave Shack Foundation, Hope for Justice, and then Step Up Stop Slavery. Please, the next one. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, excellencies and dignitaries and uh, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Dr. Carrie Johnston, for putting on such a wonderful conference. Um, I particularly want to refer to the um, this session this morning in panel two, where we're looking at um, collecting data. And at Slave Check Foundation, uh, we have an initiative where we're uh, using collective intelligence to solve issues of um, human trafficking. And um, I would just like to talk about this just a little bit. Um, collective intelligence is where we link human intelligence with artificial intelligence and data to solve problems. Uh, corporates in the world use this kind of technology to uh, refine their systems and um, it is a technology that is able to scale from uh, conversations with 10 people to conversations with 100,000 people over a number of languages. Um, as uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Pirano Gasman said this morning, uh, we need to continue conversations together beyond conferences. We need to keep on having conversations like this every day. And collective intelligence is a tool that we can use to do this. It is a way where we can exchange ideas and learn from each other um, on scale. Um, it's a way where we um, where we don't make good guesses, but we refine and we challenge and we peer review each other's discussion uh, to a point where we get to something that is really useful and a solution that can work. It's a way to gather evidence of people from a number of sectors, um, across sectors, because we have the power to gather so many people in conversation at once, um, across time and um, and across land as well. Um, it's all done online. Um, so it means that we can meet, uh, have conversations in numerous places. It's a place where we can scale 
and it's a place where we can problem solve together with the power of AI to prompt us on information, where we share not just data, but expertise across many disciplines. It's where we can evaluate ideas and rate ideas. Uh, as Dr. Zimmerman said this morning, um, we want to be able to rate things and test things. So if this is something that uh, you are interested in and you think that it would help your member state to um, engage in conversations, we would certainly love to talk to you. We're there to serve, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I want I want kindly remind again to the speaker to adhere to the designated time limit from two minutes. Um, so ne the next speaker comes from Hope for Justice. It's your. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Moderator, Special Representative, distinguished guests. My name is Tim Nelson and I'm CEO of Hope for Justice. Hope for Justice is an international anti-trafficking organization working across four continents with a vision to end slavery and change lives. And we know that partnership and collaboration working is absolutely key in what we're doing. We want to thank the OSCE and Special Representative Dr. Carrie Johnson for this opportunity to intervene today. Humanitarian crises, uh, climate change and conflict, as well as the impact of COVID-19, have a significantly increased vulnerability to exploitation. We have a human trafficking emergency on our hands. The bell is sounding. At a, at a point where resources across state and non-state actors have drastically reduced, never has there been more important time to coordinate, innovate and collaborate. Hope for Justice wishes, is, wishes to make the following proposals. Firstly, as the theme of this conference indicates, prevention, we must go beyond awareness raising and identification. We must tackle the root vulnerabilities and drivers to exploitation, as well as demand addressing the issue before the harm is done. This requires civil society and state actors to collaborate with communities and within institutional structures to address socioeconomic and gender inequality, as well as harmful social norms, reducing vulnerabilities and increasing resilience to predatory exploiters. In addition, we must understand the exponential impact of technology on all forms of exploitation and how technology can also play an important role in advancing efforts to address this issue. Business also plays a key role in reducing risk of exploitation, identifying victims and remediating harm within supply chains. And finally, survivor leaders and communities. I, we welcome the United States announcement today because we understand they play a crucial role in providing insight, understanding, and developing effective prevention approaches. Their voices, insight, and understanding must be applied across all anti-trafficking efforts, including prevention, as the experts in the field. The issue of prevention is complex, but we must never be afraid to tackle the complexity, because complex issues need comprehensive, innovative and collaborative solutions. Thank you so much for an outstanding conference. Thank you. So the next speaker comes from Step Up, Stop Slavery and followed by the organization The Smile of the Child. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Katerina Stefano. I am from Cyprus. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Step Up Stop Slavery. I'd like to thank you for an amazing conference over the past two days. And I personally am very moved and very humbled by listening to amazing survivor leaders and all these fantastic um, experts. Thank you very much. One thing that I did want to say is that traffickers not only take advantage of the weaknesses and vulnerabilities of vulnerable groups, but also in our gaps in our responses. There's three specific things that I would like to speak into that we, I think, need to improve. The first is in our implementation of our NRMs and to strengthen the collaboration between stakeholders. The second is extending the scope of stakeholders within the NRMs as well. I know lots of member states, including Cyprus, have engaged the finance industry. The finance industry has incredible power to enhance prevention by, by opening bank accounts and providing services to vulnerable groups and to survivors. 
The other thing that we need to do, I believe, is expand, as we've said a lot today, the sector engagement, specifically the health sector and the education sector. And I think it will be incredibly interesting to see the both these sectors follow the footsteps, for example, of the, the FAST initiative that have created this blueprint so they can really take a deep dive into identifying the risks, mitigating the risks, and really Tar creating targeted and proactive prevention measures. Thank you. Thank you. So um, now the next speaker comes from the smile of the child and then somebody from Men VR, please. Thank you, Honorary Chair. Um, over its 28 years of existence, the smile of the child has grown into the largest NGO for child care and child protection in Greece, and we have been actively involved and participating in the Alliance in several years. Trafficking of children is a rampant problem. Begging, forced criminality, pedophilia, organ trading are also well-known situations of children falling victim to trafficking. International adoption, unfortunately, is often also a matter of trafficking. And by the way, so is the abduction of children in the context of armed conflict. We therefore showcase a couple of tools recently and successfully put into practice by the smile of the child. One, millions of children go missing each year and they are at risk of trafficking. The Smile of the Child has put into operation a GMCN digital platform that makes it possible to locate missing children worldwide. GMCN stands for Global Missing Children's Network. The platform is an initiative of the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children, to which our organization is closely connected. It enables posting of all information and photos of missing children to be accessed by partner organizations and law enforcement, law enforcement agencies. It most importantly contains a function of searching and recognizing data in the deep and dark web in collaboration with Amazon Web Services. In addition, it additionally holds the potential to compare images of missing children from all over the world and can consequently mobilize at cross-border level, both for the location of missing children and for prosecution purposes. Second, and I'm winding up, in January 2024, we have launched in our 247 call centers, the cyber tip line Hellas an online service which gives access to all citizens easily, quickly and online to report incidents involving children whose rights are being violated and who are at risk of abuse, sexual exploitation, cyberbullying, grooming, etc., etc. Cyber Tip Line Hellas is operated in the framework of our long-standing cooperation with the United States National Center for Missing and Exploited Children with a license agreement. Cyber Tip Line innovates as it enables children and adults to submit their report from their personal safe space, answering to simple questions, but catalytically helping without any further direct interaction to potentially save another child. This is actually the spirit why we are all here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker will be from Menwia. And then I'm very sorry, but then we have to close the list. Uh, we don't have the time for, to hear from everybody. But uh, Carrie has uh, given, again, the possibility that you can send the, your intervention to her office, uh, because I think it's it would be very fruitful if we hear again uh, with the last words from the panelists. So please, um, from Menwia. Is somebody
so uh no sorry um okay now uh, i want to give the chance for our uh, panelists um petro mariam marat and Liv. do you want to say uh, again some words uh, only if you want of course um if there are something that you want to say to us I am please you can do you want to start maybe quickly um just to remind everyone you know the takeaways um for for your own thinking when you're on the flight or on the bus or you're driving back or walking back home um that really meaningful survivor inclusion is very very important in your practice a day to day um, and that holistic support for victims uh, in all aspects of, of the, the needs um, while they're exiting this, their situation is really important. Uh, we know in some states you've, you've heard of people being left in a limbo for eight years or something like that. Um, you know, that's almost someone's 10 years lost. So it's really important to have a holistic support whether, you know, some people want to access education or employment, how do you support them meaningfully? Um, and just really that we know that uh, human mobility is vital for economic growth. Let's uh, remain vigilant and um, ensure that we protect those that are vulnerable in our societies that are victims, that can fall victim to trafficking and exploitation. Um, let's ensure that all policies, uh, whether it's employment policies, migration and others are really linked. Not that one policy works, the other leaves you in a limbo. Um, and just to thank you all for lending us an ear and hope that you get back home. Um, okay, and well done to the organizers. Thank you, Mariam. Petro, do we have? Yes, so thank you. Uh, I had some closing remarks, more or less drafted, but I will I will use perhaps some of the notes uh, that I've taken during the interventions. It's not easy to say something new. After all, uh, the, the nice, interesting, good interventions that were made. Um, but I would also like to take the opportunity to thank all the panelists for their input. And, and But especially Mariam's input, I can definitely relate personally. So in my experience, a lot of what she said was really spot on and, and, and very, very relevant. And I will pick one of the recommendations uh, that, that she made, which relates to the integration of policies. And I think this is really, really important. I think it's very challenging to do uh, for, for countries, for organizations. Uh, but I can think, for example, of one very, very clear example of, of how difficult this is. Um, so at the national level within the European Union, there's something called the public employment services, which is also, it also exists at the European level. And this is just a job matching online platform. And if we think, for example, that human trafficking victims are entitled to certain uh, um, uh, safeguards and certain types of support and, and access to the labor market is one of, of those, and then to training and to vocational training and whatnot, there should be a way to use these public tools, so these public employment services that already contain a number of job offers there, and to find a, a way to connect it with uh, the national reporting uh, mechanisms or with uh, NGOs that operate in this in this area or, or um, uh, public authorities that are responsible for safeguarding victims of trafficking. There should be a way to integrate all these different platforms and to integrate all these different policies. But I do realize it's it's quite quite challenging. I think. Also something which is definitely worth uh, mentioning is that this is not just about legislation and how we enforce it. It's also about mindsets and perceptions. So I think the, 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 the perception or the threshold uh, to, to, uh, to call something a case of labor exploitation should really lower. Um, and, and the other day I was speaking with a colleague from, from, from a police authority and he was telling me that they actually found during a, a search warrant, they found someone shackled, so someone in chains uh, in, a, in, a, in a farm, if I'm not mistaken. That's a, one of the serious, serious abuses. But if we think that uh, uh, workers' rights, as soon as they are violated, we are already before some sort of, of exploitation. So this threshold also needs perhaps some revising. On awareness raising, which is actually the topic of, of today's panel, I, I again, in, in my experience and speaking to or interviewing victims uh, in, in the past, I've come to realize that the majority of them, even if they come from very remote, distant countries, they are to some extent aware that there's a risk that they are exploited, abused, trafficked, but they tend to think that it, it will not happen to them or the appeal of, of the possibility of a well-paid job somewhere else is just too strong to, to, to deny. So I think 
the like testimonies like what Marian provided us uh, here today, but offered in these origin countries and to these populations goes a long way. I think uh, these people have all seen flyers and, and some sort of information or awareness raising uh, uh, materials on, on this, but hearing it from someone who has had the experience, who comes from the same background, I think there's a lot of effectiveness attached to it. I think it's also very important to have safe reporting mechanisms. Access to compensation is definitely crucial, and it needs to take place in time. Uh, um, I, I think if it takes two, three, four, five years to get compensation, victims will just move on because they need to make a living, they need to find another job, and sometimes that takes place in another country, and then the parole process uh, is, is pointless. And I think also this creates a sense of impunity in, in, in these traffickers, where they feel that punishment is sometimes uh, perhaps lighter than it should. And then on enforcement, I think we need more preventative, but also more targeted checks. I think this, this again, has a very uh, 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 deterring effect. So workplaces should be checked in a random way, in a targeted way, involving different types of authorities to have it done in the most holistic and comprehensive way possible. Um, accessing or assessing what works and what not. So before engaging in a project and spending scarce uh, funds on something, we should really make sure that it will work, that it will reach uh, the objectives that we want. And for this, I think having this type of platform to share best practices and for colleagues to tell other uh, other colleagues what works and what not, I think it's very important. Uh, and finally, uh, just a, a bit of a provocative thought, I think there should be more resources invested into fighting human trafficking and into fighting exploitation. I think there should be a more practical follow-up to this kind of event and to this kind of discussion uh, and, and to the studies, the multiple studies that exist on this. Um, and, and, and again, looking looking to the past, at least in my in my particular situation, at the political level, human trafficking is always a very, very important issue, very high profile, but then sometimes it, it, it may not translate into uh, corresponding importance in terms of resources allocated for fighting it. Uh, and, and, and here I mean to many different types of authorities in terms of funding, in terms of human resources, in terms of training, and so on. And again, mindful of time, <laughs> we'll leave it here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Marat, do you want? Thank you. Да, я очень коротко. Вы знаете, современный мир динамичен и опасен. Новые вызовы и угрозы вот нас составляет государство принимать комплексные планы, которые как раз рекомендует и ОБСЕ. Поэтому на, на примере того же Казахстана, который мы принимаем комплексный закон с учетом всех современных реалий и превентивных мер и противодействия в правовой сфере. Я думаю, что государству можно порекомендовать, чтобы каким-то образом опыт Казахстана также был учтен. Спасибо. Thank you. Leif, you have the chance if you only, only if you want. Well, I have to admit, as a journalist, I feel a little bit of, like a fish out of water. Um, you know, we're, we're trained to uh, observe and um, report impartially on what we see. So I'm a little uncomfortable giving any sort of endorsements or recommendations. But, you know, I think having been in uh, the field covering uh, human trafficking for over 13 years, uh, there are some things I've seen. Um, one of those I think is the importance of uh, getting into the field and seeing uh, you know, human trafficking survivors as they're coming out and seeing the, the kind of look on their faces. I mean, I, I can go back to you know, multiple stories where we've seen, you know, just shattered people um, with n absolutely no hope um, in their eyes. And, you know, to, to watch that process of them going through to rehabilit be rehabilitated is really, you know, it's a beautiful thing. And six months later, they're out, you know, looking for a job, they're, you know, ed getting education and restoring their lives. And I think that that's a really really beautiful thing, uh, you know, to obviously to witness as a human being, but also if you're engaged in the uh, field of anti-trafficking, it's very important that that you, um, you know, make those connections so you understand what what we're really talking about when we're, we're talking about these victims. Um, and then in terms of preventing victims, I think, you know, so I guess the one endorsement I could make would be the, uh, the My Freedom Day event that CNN puts on. Um, you know, we've seen an incredible uh, rise in the number of schools around the world that have taken place. I think last year we had 142 countries 
the head classmates and like, you know, we, we tell the students to do something. We don't tell them what to do. We just ask them to do something to, uh, you know, help in the fight against human trafficking. And what the students come up with is amazing. Like, you know, everything from dance recitals to, um, you know, bake sales where they donate all the funds to their local anti-trafficking charity. This last year in uh, school in Kenya, they did one of those things. Like, do you remember the one take uh, like music videos where like they would have everybody kind of take part in a video, um, you know, all in one take going through the school halls. Well, they did that with a uh, drone. And so the entire school had like posters. You'd go, the drone would go into the school. They'd be like learning about human trafficking. They'd have, you know, the uh, stats on the board. Um, and then they finally wound through the school and they went out into the soccer pitch and the remaining students had all formed My Freedom Day, uh, you know, in a kind of human chain there. And so it's really exciting to see students, uh, you know, take ownership of this issue. And I think to the extent that we can encourage more uh, involvement of young people, you know, uh, explaining to them what the risks are of being trafficked and how to avoid those those risks. I think that that's certainly an opportunity we have to make a, a real difference in this fight. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And again, I'm very sorry that uh, I have closed the list, but uh, you have to ch the chance uh, to send um, your recommendations or remarks. Before we conclude, let us recap uh, some key points we have discussed. We heard about a comprehensive CTHB law in Kazakhstan the work and the role of labor inspections, the importance of learning from survivors to reshape prevention of THB, the role and the challenges of the media and the dealing with this ethical principles and prevention. Yes, and as a result, it should be noted that we have received received important information from all various perspectives and also from you from the floor. However, there are also similarities in the presentation, even if they had a different approach. So um, I will try uh, to give them to give some recommendations I heard. First of all, uh, I think everybody said it, we need a multidisciplinary and strategic approach to prevention of human trafficking. Experience from politicians, government, civil society, sur survivors, media and researchers must be linked and bundled with data. In this regard, regard states would benefit from this establishment of an independent national anti-trafficking repertoire or equivalent mechanism that can improve understanding about the nature of the problem in its various forms, evaluate the effectiveness and impact of government policies and actions against THB, and present actionable recommendations in this regard. My third recommendation is it is vital to develop a better common understanding of the causes and gaps in prevention by looking beyond what is identified and recorded into what remains latent and undressed in order to develop efficient and effective prevention, pre prevention measures. It is important to provide resources for prevention in order to fulfill these tasks and at best to enshrine this in law. Examples from OSCE participant states demonstrate clear added value of adopting a comprehensive anti-trafficking law that among others outlines states priorities with regard to prevention and sends a zero tolerance message to the society. And at final, prevention action must be framed by the development and evaluation of targeted measures for different vulnerable groups that are proactive, innovative, and flexible in order to prevent in the true sense of the word and not reactive. Thank you very much. For me, it was an honor to moderate this very important uh, panel and now at last but not least i give the floor to dr carrie johnston thank you so much Nala, for moderating uh this panel uh and for summarizing with those recommendations um, and let me also thank all of the great panelists uh for this final panel and a great note to end on. I will um, summarize with just a few closing remarks. I will try to be relatively brief because I know that everyone uh, has been has been sitting here for several hours at this point, uh, but there is a lot to reflect on uh, from the last day and a half. 
So I will um, just take a few minutes to share it with all of you. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, these two fruitful days of meaningful discussions have given me a lot of hope and encouragement in our fight to prevent and combat human trafficking. While we know the challenges that we face are multifaceted, complex, and indeed resource intensive, exchanges like these over the last two days remind us that we have allies, partners, and active engagement of anti-trafficking stakeholders ongoing across the OSCE region and beyond with champions who fight to prevent, combat, and ultimately end this heinous crime and protect victims every day. And to underscore that point, this year, we have had a record number of in-person participants in the Alliance Conference of 475. So if you're ever in doubt of how many partners and allies and champions we have uh, to collaborate in this fight against trafficking and protecting and elevating victims and survivors, let that number uh, be a good reminder. And let me express my immense gratitude for everyone here and all of the, the roles and the efforts that you each play. My hope is that this Alliance Conference and its platform will continue to serve as a further catalyst for idea sharing, networking, and collaboration, and inspire further strengthened efforts across the OSCE region and beyond. We know effectively preventing and combating human trafficking requires a societal change, and it's going to take all of us. From political leaders who are just starting to engage on this topic, to activists who have worked on it for years, from parliamentarians who can adopt new laws and allocate resources to the media who strive to raise awareness, prompt action, and increase human trafficking literacy to labor inspectors who have an important role to play in preventing and detecting the crime. From experienced healthcare workers and private sector companies to survivors who rise from exploitation and are now leading the movement with their expertise and passion. Each of us has an important role to play. United in purpose, we can bring an end to this abhorrent crime and protect and empower those exploited and at risk of trafficking. As we've heard over these last two days, our prevention efforts should be tailored to address the vulnerabilities that, target, that traffickers themselves target. Throughout the conference, we've highlighted the importance of considering and addressing inherent or circumstantial vulnerability factors, including race, ethnicity, sex, gender, age, national or social origin, in the intersections between them that can increase trafficking risks. We've heard in both panel discussions and through side events more in depth about the nexus between human trafficking and disabilities and human trafficking and minorities, vulnerabilities that have often been overlooked and under-resourced researched and resourced. We hope these discussions on vulnerabilities will be the catalyst for further analysis and action that will equip professionals to ensure tailored and effective prevention efforts to both help identify and protect victims and prevent people from ever becoming victims at all. As we know, traffickers prey on the marginalized and most vulnerable, but we are also witnessing, as we've heard over these days, an emerging trend where the demographic profile of trafficking victims is also expanding at pace with the digital developments in which we are living. We are witnessing trafficking increasingly intersecting or even merging with other crimes such as illicit drugs, fraud, scams, where perpetrators are disguised behind victims. Covering all these different angles to ensure comprehensive, effective trafficking prevention measures and strategies We've heard from an impressive set of speakers over the past day and a half, and I thank them for their insightful presentations and ideas. Let me also try to offer a summary of some of the key action steps from this year's Alliance, because indeed, all of the information and uh, data and ideas that we've heard are incredibly important, but what's most important is the actions that we all take as we leave today. First, let us remind ourselves of the core objective of prevention to reduce and ultimately eliminate the likelihood that traffickers will exploit people. Given the variety of vulnerabilities and forms of trafficking we discussed, a broad range of governmental and non-governmental stakeholders and mandates should be deployed, and multidisciplinary collaboration mechanisms should be established or refined to develop efficient, effective, and ethical prevention measures. 
Importantly, as we have seen over the course of these two days, we must integrate the expertise of survivors when strategizing on prevention, as they are the ones who know exactly where we failed before. Second, utilizing data is key to develop effective prevention methods and assessing their effectiveness. This conference has emphasized the importance of systematically mapping and identifying vulnerabilities and their intersections to tailor policies and initiatives that truly prevent trafficking. By establishing an independent national anti-trafficking repertoire or similar mechanism, states can ensure that these strategies and implemented initiatives are based on accurate data and empirical evidence, rather than outdated assumptions and anecdotal information. Third, as we know, human trafficking is not a standalone issue. It has profound consequences on both individual health and society as a whole. As one expert noted, violence is often intertwined with various contributing factors, underscoring the need for comprehensive intervention strategies rooted in public health frameworks and counterviolence strategies. Cross-sector collaboration among health, education, social services, law enforcement, labor inspectors, and private sector is crucial to address interconnected problems between violence and effectively combating human trafficking. Fourth, prevention should be the focal point of a national anti-trafficking strategy. At the legislative level, an article in the criminal code penalizing trafficking is not enough to secure and solidify all-encompassing protection. Sorry, prevention. The adoption of a comprehensive anti-trafficking law enhances a state's capacity to develop robust prevention policies and measures and make the best use of its investment of funds and human resources. Fifth, with laws in place, the next step is ensuring their effective implementation. In many places, good laws exist, but lack the effective implementation that fosters a culture of non-discrimination throughout the anti-trafficking response, protecting those who need it most in line with OSCE commitments. And finally, six, I urge all states to demonstrate the essential political will needed to actively prevent and combat human trafficking. In the face of daunting challenges posed by events such as the war against Ukraine, which has led to a surge of individuals facing heightened trafficking risks, both in physical and online domains, we have witnessed the remarkable dedication of states within the OSC region in this regard, showing that it is possible to address risk factors and implement prevention efforts when the will is there. Where there is a will, there is a way. To further effectively address evolving threats, we must prioritize the allocation of resources towards implementing proven initiatives. Mobilizing collective action is paramount in reshaping and strengthening our prevention strategies to make a real and lasting impact on the fight against trafficking. Now, please allow me a few notes of profound thanks. First, let me thank each of you for your participation in these discussions from governments, civil society, the private sector, the media, and academics. I'm also grateful for all of our fabulous speakers, panelists, and moderators, including particularly our colleagues with lived experience who have demonstrated clearly the critical importance of integrating the expertise of survivors and we are inspired by your resilience, courage, and knowledge. We also could not do this without our fantastic interpreters. Thank you for making this possible. And finally, my deep gratitude and respect to each person in our office for their hard work and dedication to make this conference possible and as impactful as possible. Special thanks to the main organizer of this year's conference, Tarana Bagirova, and the magician behind the scenes, Jaydan Shafiova. I'd also like to thank our communications team led by Marianne Angvik, who has helped us creatively get the word out so that we had more people participating in the conference this year and also to help amplify the messages. It is an honor to work with such fantastic, dedicated colleagues. I sincerely hope that each of you will take away from these two days great ideas, practical suggestions, and inspiration to put them into practice. 
I hope you will build on the partnerships that you've made or deepened here to take important actions. Indeed, each of you in the broader society of the OSCE has an important role to play. Together, we can turn the tide and prevent trafficking and all the harm that it causes. May the perspectives and ideas that you've heard here these last two days light the way. And with that, I close the 24th Alliance Conference. Thank you very much.